Of all the so-called golden eras in the history of the United States, the Gilded Age emerges as an epoch of unequaled opulence and grandeur, a time when a few formidable families not only amassed extraordinary wealth, but also stitched their names into the very fabric of the rags-to-riches American ethos. This was an era where industrial titans and financial barons reigned supreme, fueled by a burgeoning economy, the absence of an income tax, and the robust engines of the Industrial Revolution. Today, we journey back to this dazzling period, uncovering the breathtaking sagas of America's wealthiest Gilded Age dynasties. From the Astors and Vanderbilts to the Rockefellers and Carnegies, each family wove its own narrative of ambition, influence, and in some cases, self-inflicted decline. Their stories are more than mere chronicles of wealth accumulation. They are emblems of the transformative power of American enterprise and entrepreneurial vision. With that said, let us begin with America's very first multimillionaires, a family whose surname is still subtly stamped all across the land of the free and the home of the brave. However, the truth of how they went from new money to old money has never been fully revealed until now. The year 1848. The locale, New York City, humming with life, yet the Astor Mansion stood in a cold contrast its aura of regality offering a muted hush. John Jacob Astor, his legendary family's first magnate, lay on his bed, life flickering like a dying candle. The bed, resplendent in silk and rich mahogany, was an ironic setting for a man who began his journey in the ruggedness of Waldorf, Germany, and the son of a simple butcher. His saga, powered by a monumental spirit, led him across the Atlantic, driven by dreams too large for his small German hamlet. From fixing musical instrumentals to peddling fur, from dabbling in fledgling real estate to mastering finance, he embroidered his success into the fabric of a new world, weaving a legacy in golden threads. Now his son William stood sentinel at his bedside, eyes hard, matching his father's steel. An understanding passed between them, as silent as the room and as profound as the coming inheritance. Make it grow, William, the old Aster rasped a lifetime of victories and struggles faintly echoing in his voice. Yet little did he know that his earthly departure would not mark the end of an era, but the beginning. It would be not only an immense fortune he passed on to his son William, but the seeds of a transatlantic empire. In today's video at Old Money Luxury, we shall recount the incredible true life story of the Astors, America's first old money family, from the dusty roads of rural Germany to the hallowed halls of Westminster to the affluent avenues of the city that never sleeps. So settle in and join us as we describe how the Astor family went from new money to old money. In the rural enclave of Waldorf, nestled near the regal city of Heidelberg, now part of contemporary Baden-Württemberg, Germany, a son was welcomed into the world in 1763. The newborn, christened John Jacob Astor, was the youngest scion of Johann Jacob Astor, a humble butcher and Maria Magdalena von Berg. At the tender age of 16, John Jacob departed his home for the bustling city of London, where he fell under the tutelage of his uncle in the art of crafting musical instruments. Our lovely English capital, in its grandeur, not only provided Astor with proficiency in English, but also a robust apprenticeship in the realm of commerce. The year 1784 marked Astor's embarkation to the United States, his pockets filled with little more than hopes and a collection of several flutes for sale. He chose New York City as his new home, where he opened a small but ambitious shop trading in furs. The 1794 Jay Treaty, which allowed Americans to trade in Canada, served as a catalyst from which to build the empire that would come to create America's first old money family. By the turn of the century, Jacob had accumulated a fortune of six million dollars, an eye-watering amount of wealth for an era where America was less than 20 years old and reigned as the luminary of the fur trade. He then diversified his portfolio, trading furs for Chinese tea and investing in Manhattan's burgeoning real estate market, becoming a notable figure in fur transactions in China. Additionally, John Jacob's brother Henry, an enthusiast of equine racing and a German immigrant like himself, purchased a thoroughbred messenger who had journeyed from England to America in 1788. This noble steed would sire all standard bred horses in America, adding a unique chapter to the Astor family legacy. Now, the demise of Meriwether Lewis in 1809 
ignited a quest for an able governor for the area. Asta saw an opportunity, proposing a daring plan to monopolize and extend the fur trade to the Pacific. His venture employed Wilson Price Hunt, a St. Louis businessman, to lead an overland expedition to the Columbia River. The journey, though fraught with disastrous decisions, inadvertently led to seminal discoveries and paved the path known today as the Oregon Trail. This venture formed the bedrock for American development of Oregon and Washington. You see, Astor's empire held a near monopoly on the fur trade, and by the 1820s it stood as one of the largest enterprises in the nascent United States. Yet, by 1834, the illustrious Astor exited the company he had built, partially due to a shift in fashion trends leading to the decline of fur's popularity, causing the company to fragment. However, by then, Astor had already acquired the title of America's very first multimillionaire and the world's richest man. Now, John Jacob Astor's demise on the 29th of March, 1848, marked the end of an era. With a fortune worth a staggering $20 million, Astor passed as the richest person in America. To give a perspective on how wildly large this fortune was in today's terms, if we compare Astor's wealth to the gross national product of America at that time, his net worth would be similar to a 2023 sum of $121 billion, competing with only the likes of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk on the world stage. And John Jacob's penchant for philanthropy was equally illustrious, dedicating $400,000 from his coffers to the establishment of the Astor Library, the esteemed institution that would later coalesce with the Lenox Library to become the iconic New York Public Library. Now his firstborn son, John Jr. from birth, was plagued by a disheartening blend of ill health and mental issues, thus leading to John Jacob's will giving him an allowance just adequate to assure his sustenance in the uncertain times ahead. Therefore, the lion's share of the Astor's immense wealth, coupled with the destiny of their family empire, was bestowed upon the capable shoulders of his second son, William, thus positioning the next move on the grand chessboard towards old money dominance the Astor family would play in this game of familial intrigue. Now, William Backhouse Astor Sr., named after William Backhouse, his father's merchant friend, over the course of his life would prove his mettle as a competent associate in his father's prosperous export enterprise, all while carefully injecting capital into Manhattan's fertile soil of real estate. Emboldened by his family's already legendary business reputation, William amplified the empire's real estate portfolio, erecting over 700 stores and homes in the growing New York City. His real estate ventures around Central Park yielded exponential growth for the family assets. Understand William, an astute operator himself, not merely preserved, but managed to multiply the Astor family fortune. His diligent endeavors led to even more prosperity for their lineage, his legacy culminating in a staggering estate valued at nearly $50 million. It was as though Midas himself had passed his golden touch onto the next Astors, and they wielded this gift with expert precision. However, in the long arc of family law, the most crucial move William made was a defining characteristic of old money dynasties, strategic intermarriage. On the 20th day of May in the year 1818, he took the hand of Miss Margaret Alida Rebecca Armstrong, the children of Senator John Armstrong Jr. and Elida, sister to Horatio Gates Armstrong. From her mother's side, she claimed lineage from the renowned Livingston clan, her own mother the youngest offspring of the eminent Judge Robert Livingston and his wife Margaret. Furthermore, her pedigree included such luminaries as founding father Robert R. Livingston and Secretary of State Edward Livingston. On the other side, her father, John Armstrong Jr., held the distinguished title of President James Madison's second Secretary of War. From this impressive brood, William and Margaret's offspring would include a shockingly impressive third generation of Astors to steer their colossal empire. John Jacob Astor III, born during a balmy summer's day on the 10th of June in 1822, would thrive as an American financier, generous benefactor, and a soldier in the American Civil War. His extraordinary business acumen served to bolster his personal fortune, much like his father and grandfather, eventually earning him the title of the richest amongst the Astor lineage from his generation. 
By the end of his reign, he would come to grow the family coffers to a stratospheric range between $75 million and $100 million, around 2.5 to 3.5 billion in today's dollars. Though again, we must remember that this was a time when the US had a much lower GDP than we have today, thus indicating that $3 billion back then may be closer to 80 or 90 billion relative to today's economies. John III's proudest achievement, however, lay in the establishment of the English branch of the Astor dynasty. It was this branch that cemented the Astor name amongst the British nobility, an enduring legacy that even to this day continues to take pride of place in the aristocratic circles, and we'll cover more in a minute. Now, William and Margaret's daughter, Laura Eugenia Astor, born in 1824, married to a man by the soon-to-be conspicuously American name of Franklin Hughes Delano on the 17th of September, 1844. This unforeseen twist of destiny would link the Astors with another echelon of the closest thing America has to royalty, the Roosevelts. Franklin Hughes was, after all, the namesake of a certain US president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This union also reinforced the Astors' ties with America's founding stock, given Franklin Hughes Delano's lineage traced back to Philip Delano, a pilgrim who set foot in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1621. Our tale now settles upon William Astor Jr., the bearing carrier of his forefather's illustrious American legacy. Yet it was actually his wife, the imposing Caroline Shermerhorn, who would seize the reins of New York's elite, sculpting the bedrock of its high society. Born to the privileged echelons of New York's Dutch aristocracy on September 22, 1830, Caroline, or Lina as she was affectionately known, was a Shermerhorn, offspring of the city's earliest settlers. Her father, Abraham Shermerhorn, had made his fortune in shipping and possessed a net worth of half a million dollars, a significant sum for the time, equivalent to $13.74 million today. Helen Van Cortland, nay white, of the prominent Shermerhorns, was her mother. Fate entwined Caroline Shermerhorn and William Astor Jr., the grandson of John Jacob Astor, in a harmonious union in 1853. An intriguing piece of history unfolded in 1862 when the couple commissioned a fashionable four-bay brownstone townhouse at 355th Avenue, an address that would later be home to none other than the Empire State Building. Now, contrary to popular perception that she was always more focused on high society than family, Mrs. Astor, for a considerable part of her years as a mother of young children, devoted herself to her family and household management. Additionally, a hefty inheritance from her parents afforded her a level of financial independence uncharacteristic for women of her era. As the years passed, Caroline Astor's sphere of influence, aptly known as the 400, emerged as a cornerstone of New York's Gilded Age society. You see, the city's population had swelled dramatically post-Civil War, with wealthy migrants and immigrants challenging the traditional stronghold of the New York elite. Teaming up with the revered social arbitrator, Ward McAllister, a kin of Samuel Cutler Ward, who had joined the Astor clan through marriage, Mrs. Astor began to shape the rules of decorum and select the acceptable newcomers to their esteemed circles. McAllister famously claimed that amidst the grandeur of Gilded Age New York, a mere 400 could truly qualify as members of fashionable society. The Queen of Society, as she came to be known, Mrs. Astor solidified her exclusive circle by throwing a grand annual ball on the third Monday of January. Scoring an invitation was seen as the ultimate accolade, the golden ticket confirming one's place within the glittering edifice of New York society. Caroline Astor during this era was renowned for her impeccable grace, scrupulous discretion, and a tongue that never courted controversy. Her amicable demeanor belied a certain detachment. She was never one for unsolicited intimacy, nor was she given to sharing confidences. Her social sphere was rigid, an unassailable bastion of old money, steadfastly unyielding in the maelstrom of changing times and values. Yet for all their staunch traditionalism, the Astors' fame reached far beyond their native shores, their names synonymous with the creme de la creme of the elite. The press found themselves inexplicably drawn to their lives, the grandeur, the scandals, case in point, the affair of Lady Caroline's attires. Much to the delight of the international press, Caroline Astor's sumptuous gowns, intricately adorned with apple-green silk, velvet, and ostentatious ostrich feathers, 
were intercepted by government agents under the suspicion of luxury duty evasion. Months of speculation followed as the world pondered whether Astor would capitulate to the looming charges of $300 to $400. Lady Astor remained adamantly defiant and, in the end, her gowns were put to auction. Curiously enough, it could be suggested that the Astors meticulously manufactured their connotation as old money, cleverly maneuvering the public's perception of older groups as new money. The quintessential example of this was their complex dynamic with the Vanderbilts. The Vanderbilts, a family known for wealth amassed rather than inherited, represented a form of opulence that the Astors found rather gauche and nouveau riche, particularly railroad money, which was distasteful in the eyes of Mrs. Astor. As such, she found herself reluctant to entertain the Vanderbilt daughters. Yet, in 1883, she felt compelled to formally acknowledge the socially prominent Alva Erskine Smith, spouse of William Kissam Vanderbilt, granting the Vanderbilts access to the upper echelons of society. A popular tale swirling around the high society circles tells of Alva Vanderbilt orchestrating an opulent costume ball at her residence, yet depriving young Caroline Astor, Lena's youngest, of her participation, as Mrs. Astor had not extended a formal call. Observing the Vanderbilt's ascent, Lady Astor, foreseeing the strategic advantage of their alliance in maintaining the exclusivity of New York's high society, extended an olive branch and attended Alva's grand ball. Thereafter, the Vanderbilts were graced with invitations to Lady Astor's annual soiree, symbolizing their official ascension into New York's high society. Now, after the demise of the indomitable Lady Astor, the role of reigning queen of New York society was a mantle too weighty for one woman. The responsibility fell upon the heavy shoulders of three ladies of prestige, Marion Graves Anthon Fish, the genteel wife of Stuyvesant Fish, Teresa Fair Ulrichs, the glamorous spouse of Herman Ulrichs, and Alva Belmont, who had found a new companion in Oliver Belmont. In this same circle of power and affluence, Mrs. Astor's son, John Jacob Astor IV, a businessman of extraordinary prowess, writer, military officer in the Spanish-American War, sadly breathed his last in the calamitous sinking of the Titanic. With an estate valuing approximately $87 million, a fortune that would be the equivalent of $2.64 billion today, Astor was the wealthiest among the unfortunate souls on the ill-fated voyage, and arguably one of the world's richest men during his time. At the same time, on the other side of the pond, the Astor lineage grew nobler, cultivating its prestige through the illustrious titles of Viscount Astor and Baron Astor of Hever. First, a wealthy American Astor by the name of William Waldorf Astor took the bold step of transplanting himself to the British soils in 1891, later adopting the mantle of British citizenry in 1899. As a mark of his sterling contribution to the wartime charities, he was awarded a baronage in 1916 and elevated to a Viscount a year later. Thus was the birth of the Viscount Astor, granted by the peerage of the United Kingdom on a summer afternoon in 1917, forever intertwining the Astors with the annals of British nobility. In the mid-century year of 1956, another title was fashioned within the peerage of the United Kingdom. This was the title of Baron Astor of Hever awarded to the influential newspaper baron and conservative politician, another John Jacob Astor, the fourth offspring of William Waldorf Astor, first Viscount Astor. In today's world, certain Astor descendants, such as William Astor, fourth Viscount Astor, persist in wielding their influence, notably in the British House of Lords. However, the family fortune has been eroded over time, with certain heirs grappling with monetary hardships. One poignant symbol of this decline is the family's 420-acre estate, now wearing the signs of neglect due to insufficient maintenance funds. Thus, the Astor name, once synonymous with America's affluent uppermost echelons, has faced a gradual diminution in its prestige. While their mark on New York City's panorama and the American milieu remains indelible, their once venerated status has taken a quiet retreat. Yet for all their dwindling wealth and influence, the Astor lineage has left an indelible legacy on the city that never sleeps. The cityscape is peppered with edifices bearing the Astor insignia, including many streets, buildings and companies. Institutions like the modern St. Regis Hotel and the Astor 
alongside various other landmarks, indeed echo their erstwhile glory. Therefore, the story of the Astor family's evolution from new money to old money serves as a potent reminder of both the importance of diversification and the transience of time and success, no matter what heights of success you reach. And, for what it's worth, the name Astor will always hold weight in the Western world. Peering through an oppressive cloak of fog during the somber twilight hours of New York City in the year 1947, there looms an imposing spectre, the decaying Vanderbilt Triple Palace. Once a shining beacon of grandeur and prosperity, it now echoes with the hushed whispers of a forgotten splendor. In its heyday, the palace glistened like a diamond under the opulent glow of gaslit chandeliers. Rooms were decked with European art, while gilded mirrors reflected the refined tastes of the era's elite. The echoes of laughter, clinking crystal, and impassioned debates filled the grand halls, all bearing testimony to the meteoric rise of the Vanderbilt dynasty. However, the current visage of the Triple Palace was an unnerving contrast. Its decadent opulence had faded, traded for an ominous air of dereliction. The silent corridors now reeked of neglect and abandonment. The imposing structure that epitomized luxury now bore the scars of time and indifference, a granite edifice teetering on the brink of oblivion. Pondering such a heart-wrenching image, one might ask, how did this majestic empire collapse, surrendering its palatial grandeur to time's merciless grasp? Join us on this intriguing journey to answer your query as we embark on an expedition to once and for all explain how the Vanderbilt family went from old money to no money. The dawn of the 19th century unveiled a new titan in the American commercial narrative, a man by the name of Cornelius Vanderbilt, affectionately known as the Commodore. His tale opens in the rugged setting of Staten Island, New York, in 1794. Birthed fourth in a lineage of nine, young Cornelius was cast in the Forge of Humility, born into an environment of limited means. Looking back through history, the seeds of the Vanderbilt legacy can be traced to De Bilt, nestled in the heart of Utrecht, Netherlands. Here, Jan Ertsen, Cornelius's great-great-great-grandfather and a humble Dutch farmer, sought a new life in New Amsterdam, the city that would eventually bear the name New York. In an amazing twist of fate, this ancestor of one of America's wealthiest dynasties came to the New World not only penniless, but was forced into indentured servitude upon his arrival in 1650. However, his backbreaking work would turn out to be the sacrifice that set the Vanderbilt legacy in motion. His village name, suffixed by the Dutch Vander, translated to of the built, eventually morphed over generations into the weighty name of Vanderbilt. Now the inception of Cornelius's empire was marked at the tender age of 16, as he gambled on a ferry service operation between Staten Island and Manhattan, funded by a loan of $100 from his mother. This modest venture bloomed into a colossal fortune exceeding $100 million, a staggering sum that today's standards would value over $200 billion. Cornelius Vanderbilt, a figure cast in the mold of determination and intelligence, etched his path to prosperity through an inexhaustible work ethic and shrewd business maneuvering. His simple ferry service expanded its reach during the tumultuous times of the War of 1812, serving the far-flung government outposts strewn around New York City. As peace was restored, Vanderbilt shifted his sights to the steamship industry, aligning himself with the strategic acumen of Thomas Gibbons. Possessing an innate radar for identifying opportunities within fledgling markets, Vanderbilt seized control of the steamboat and nascent railroad industries, effectively transforming the American landscape. In particular, his strategic mastery lay in his ability to grow markets, outmaneuvering competition through offering accessible prices and exploring untapped territories. He built his businesses on the burgeoning pillars of customer satisfaction, efficiency, frugality, and uncompromising consequences for dishonesty or idleness. And even better, this agile titan was no stranger to industry evolution. His adaptability became evident when he smoothly transitioned from steamboats to railroads. Not merely content with business savvy, Vanderbilt was also a ruthless competitor, infamous for his aggressive tactics in obliterating competition. And with regard to his temperament, as a man of few words, Vanderbilt was esteemed for his impeccable judgment of character. He often remained stoic in the face of criticism, steadfast in his decisions, his unyielding determination and adaptability. This drive allowed him to amass a formidable fortune, crowning him as one of the wealthiest Americans of the 19th century. 
In fact, his lifestyle could be described as having an even Spartan-like frugality, a trait inherited from his mother. This very deliberate lifestyle choice marked him as an outlier, creating a tangible rift between himself and the glittering upper echelons of high society. Yet, unbeknownst to the Commodore, a dramatic shift loomed on the horizon. His descendants, heirs to the Vanderbilt fortune, would cast away their patriarch's doctrine of frugality. They instead embraced a life dripping with extravagance and opulence, casting aside the lessons of their forebear and eventually, as the kids today would say, fumbling the bag. You see, their actions would signal a stark departure from Cornelius's principles, setting the stage for a story of epic downfall and squandered wealth. A tale as grand as their inheritance, filled with missteps, excesses and lavish spending that would threaten the very existence of the Vanderbilt fortune. With the arsenal of family lineage and robust wealth at their disposal, one could imagine the Vanderbilts flourishing as an enduring emblem of American old money. Yet, in an unexpected twist of fate, Cornelius Vanderbilt's descendants took a nosedive into the realms of opulence and luxurious excess. The precursor to this ill-fated journey was William Henry Vanderbilt, Cornelius's son. Despite his pedigree, he failed to instill the old money ethos into his eight offspring, arguably raising several who were, alas, spoiled brats beyond measure. In his personal life, William managed to amass an estate worth $200 million by the time of his demise in 1885, doubling his father's empire. However, whispers of his volatile temperament and emotional inconsistency cast a shadow over his accomplishments, and likely hint at how he would come to raise a generation of intemperate progeny. Early anecdotes recount tales reminiscent of HBO's succession, portraying the relationship between William and his father, Cornelius, akin to that of Logan Roy and Kendall Roy. Cornelius, often frustrated with his eldest son, called him a blockhead and blatherskite. William yearned to prove otherwise, but lacked the courage to face the Commodore's censure. However, a turning point arrived during a family voyage to Europe aboard the steamship Vanderbilt in 1860. Following this trip, father and son grew closer, and William assumed an increasingly integral role in the Vanderbilt business empire. Yet, once at the helm, William's unpredictable nature became a public nuisance. One incident in particular occurred in 1883, when journalist John Dickinson Sherman questioned him about his operation of the limited express train service. One incident in particular occurred in 1883. To a question about whether the trains were run for public convenience, William retorted, the public be damned. This outburst reflected the growing detachment of the Vanderbilt lineage from the principles of their patriarch. Upon the demise of William Henry Vanderbilt, the family's financial leviathan passed into the hands of his sons, Cornelius Vanderbilt II and William Kissam Vanderbilt. This heralded a new era in the dynasty's narrative, one marked by an increasingly convoluted distribution of wealth. The vast Vanderbilt fortune, once a concentrated reservoir of wealth, began to spread thin across an ever-growing family tree. With each passing generation, the inheritance split among a growing number of descendants. As family branches multiplied, the division of assets exacerbated, gradually diluting the individual shares of the once enormous family wealth. Simultaneously, the formidable grasp of inheritance taxes began to gnaw at the edges of the family's fortune. As one generation passed and handed down their wealth to the next, each transfer was met with sizable tax implications. Over time, these seemingly harmless nibbles transformed into significant bites out of the family coffers. The shadow of such financial burdens grew longer with each subsequent generation, steadily eroding the formidable Vanderbilt fortune. Worse still, the family was plagued by a series of reckless financial choices. Much of the Vanderbilt progeny, far removed from the industrious ethos of their forebear, failed to demonstrate the same business acumen and financial prudence that Cornelius Vanderbilt had once embodied. High-risk ventures, failed investments, and a lack of interest in nurturing the family's business interests dealt a series of devastating blows to their wealth. Compounding this was their inclination towards a luxurious lifestyle. Unlike the Commodore, the descendants reveled in extravagance and opulence. They spent prodigiously, indulging in grand mansions, ostentatious parties, and lavish art collections. Such unrestrained spending only served to accelerate the decline of the once mighty Vanderbilt fortune. This combination of expanding family size, punishing inheritance taxes, imprudent financial decisions, and unabated spending 
cast a foreboding shadow over the Vanderbilt dynasty. The fortune, once a titan in the annals of American wealth, gradually began its descent into oblivion. By the mid-20th century, the Vanderbilt star had considerably dimmed in the American public sphere, as evidenced by the fate of their grand Fifth Avenue mansions, many of which were sold, demolished or repurposed as museums. A mere 30 years post Cornelius Vanderbilt's death, not a single Vanderbilt was listed among the wealthiest Americans. Tragically, within half a century of the Commodore's passing, the vast Vanderbilt fortune had entirely evaporated. Now, let us delve deeper into the distinctive factors that precipitated the decline of the Vanderbilt wealth and juxtapose it with a family that, despite amassing wealth during the same era, managed to sustain it through generations. To understand the contrasts, let's first consider a hypothetical scenario. Imagine a dominant figure at the helm of a multi-billion dollar family empire suddenly succumbing to illness. The CEO, who doesn't belong to the family, has handpicked a COO as his successor. Yet the board remains divided in its support. The company's financial health is waning, prompting board anxieties. Without the board's unanimous backing, exploring alternative CEO candidates becomes imperative. Further convoluting matters is the Greenhorn board chair, a family member with another family member and controlling shareholder expecting this chair to ascend as the next CEO. This scenario may seem unusual, but in the world of family-owned businesses, finding a successor is a complex labyrinth. The Vanderbilt family's story mirrors this scenario. The dispersion of their fortune during the third generation corresponded with diminishing family interest in their key asset, the New York Central, coupled with escalating expenses. The Vanderbilts were known for their philanthropy, especially William Keesom Vanderbilt of the third generation, who donated millions to numerous causes. Yet, the dawn of income and estate taxes and the family's incessant spending hastened their wealth's decline. During the initial stages of their wealth accumulation, there was a minimal business regulatory framework, allowing them a free hand in dominating entire industries. The era they thrived in was marked by an absence of income and estate taxes, which meant that the Vanderbilts were able to amass an unimaginable fortune free of governmental restrictions or financial drains. However, as societal norms and governmental policies evolved, the Vanderbilts found themselves facing new challenges. This era also saw an increased regulatory focus on monopolies and business practices, adding another layer of complexity to maintaining and growing their fortune. Further exacerbating this situation was the Great Depression, which wreaked havoc on the American economy. It affected the Vanderbilt's investments and economic interests, leading to a significant downturn in their fortunes. The Rockefeller family, conversely, employed shrewd strategies to safeguard their wealth. John D. Rockefeller's business, via generation-skipping trusts, ensured wealth propagation through the generations. A generation-skipping trust allows the transfer of substantial amounts of money tax-free, skipping a generation, usually passing from the grantor to the grandchildren, rather than the children. In the Rockefeller's case, they managed to retain and multiply their wealth by channeling it down to more distant generations, rather than distributing it among immediate successors. The Vanderbilts, however, after a few generations, lacked an established core business that could continuously feed wealth into their trust. Their approach primarily involved the passing of assets directly from parent to child in each generation. This strategy not only exposed their wealth to the successive imposition of estate taxes with each generational transfer, but also made their fortune vulnerable to the lavish spending habits of each inheritor. The Rockefellers, by structuring their wealth transfer through a generation-skipping trust, managed to avoid these pitfalls and ensure the long-term preservation of their family's wealth. And what else set the Rockefellers apart? David Rockefeller Jr., chairman of Rockefeller & Company in a rare interview, spoke of a system of values, traditions and institutions developed by the family. These mechanisms aided the family in staying united and preserving their wealth, serving as practical tools for any family trying to instill sound monetary values in their children. Remarkably, the Rockefeller family largely remained unified, devoid of public scandals, feuds, lawsuits or tragedies that typically plague wealthy dynasties. Today, over 250 direct descendants of John D. Rockefeller and Laura Spellman Rockefeller form the family. We meet as a family twice a year, often more than 100 of us in a room for a Christmas lunch, for example, said David Rockefeller. From the age of 21, family members are invited to these gatherings, aptly called the Family Forum. Here they discuss the family's direction, 
new members, career news and other significant milestones. They ensure everyone feels part of the family including those who married into it. Preserving the family history is also deemed essential. The Rockefellers do this through their familial homesteads, places passed down over generations where they can reconnect with their past. I can go back to the place where my great-grandfather lived over 100 years ago and see how he lived and see how his son and their grandchildren lived," added David Rockefeller. Such practices exemplify the different approaches two similarly wealthy families took to wealth preservation. The Vanderbilt legacy today is a fascinating tale of resilience, adaptation and lessons learned from the rise and fall of one of America's wealthiest families. Despite the family's difficulties and the decline of their once vast fortune, some members of the Vanderbilt family have managed to create their own paths and leave lasting impressions on society. Gloria Vanderbilt, a descendant of the Vanderbilt family, faced a difficult life marked by personal tragedies and challenges. Born in 1924, she was the daughter of Reginald Claypool Vanderbilt and Gloria Morgan Vanderbilt. At a young age, Gloria was thrust into the spotlight during a highly publicized custody battle between her mother and her paternal aunt, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. Despite these early hardships, Gloria went on to become a highly respected and successful artist, fashion designer and author. Her resilience and determination to forge her own path endeared her to the public and made her a beloved figure. Throughout her life, Gloria Vanderbilt was not only a colorful, but also a very successful personality who made many contributions to the society in which she lived and thrived. She was an exceptional, vivacious fashion icon, renowned for her distinctive style and the widely successful Vanderbilt's brand. In a fascinating aside, one of our followers at Old Money Luxury shared a personal interaction with Gloria Vanderbilt, recalling, I met Gloria Vanderbilt at her New York art show in 2003. She was elegant, well-bred, polite, soft-spoken and greeted me with a big smile on her face. Her hair, makeup, clothes were impeccable and understated. Her teeth and complexion were perfect. I'm so glad I met her, I've read her books. She lived appropriately. She was an iconic figure who needed protection from devious people. At her level of wealth, she had friendships with designers, actors, singers, lawyers, professors, business people with education and talent. She loved her sons deeply. Gloria's sons, Anderson Cooper and Carter Vanderbilt Cooper, also faced their share of challenges growing up as Vanderbilt descendants. Anderson Cooper, a well-known journalist and television personality, has spoken openly about the impact of his family's history on his life and career. He has expressed gratitude for the opportunities his family's legacy has afforded him, while also acknowledging the importance of hard work and self-reliance. Tragically, Carter Vanderbilt Cooper passed by his own hand at the age of 23, a devastating loss for the family. The current financial situation of the Vanderbilt descendants varies, as the once enormous family fortune has been significantly diminished over the years. Many of the family's descendants have pursued careers in various fields, from journalism to fashion, and have built their own wealth and success independent of the family's legacy. The family's remaining assets and lingering influence can still be seen in the form of their historic mansions, such as the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina, and the Breakers in Newport, Rhode Island. These properties serve as reminders of the family's immense wealth and influence during the Gilded Age and continue to attract visitors from around the world. The rise and fall of the Vanderbilts offers valuable lessons for future generations. The importance of responsible wealth management, strategic estate planning, and the potential pitfalls of excessive spending and poor investment decisions are all evident in the family's story. Additionally, the Vanderbilt legacy serves as a reminder of the importance of resilience and adaptability in the face of adversity. Before the democratization of status and social media, where anybody with an iPhone and a bit of cheeky personality could become a megastar thanks to apps like Instagram, TikTok, or, dare I say, even YouTube itself, Society certainly had what today we would call influencers, but they were surely a cut above the folly and hijinks exhibited by the Jake Pauls and Kim Kardashians of the world. Indeed, the Astors, a lineage directly descended from America's very first multimillionaire, were the epitome of American high society. Holding a family name synonymous with opulence and social influence during the 19th and early 20th centuries, in today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we'll explain, step by step, how this legendary old money dynasty created high society as we know it, wielding social savvy, political clout and strategic marriages, 
to serve as the architects of New York City's social norms for the 1% of the 1%. Long before John Jacob Astor ascended as America's first multimillionaire wealth in the early 19th century, the 13 British colonies, and later the fledgling United States, were already the domain of established families of considerable means. For generations, these families had held sway over the nation's political landscape, and their roots often stretched back to the period before the American Revolution. You see, the forebears of these families accumulated their fortunes through a myriad of avenues, among them elite planters, prosperous merchants, slave owners, shipbuilders. Additionally, geography played its role. In states such as Virginia, Maryland and the Carolinas, acres upon acres of land, either bestowed by British royalty or gained through colonial-era so-called head rights, formed the bedrock of these families' prosperity. And their legacy was often not merely one of wealth, but of statesmanship. Indeed, they counted among their numbers several of the founding fathers and the early presidents of the United States, men who would stand in the crucible of revolution and constitutional formation. Yet, with all of that said, the American colonies had been largely peopled by those whom historians describe as the middling sort, what we today would identify as the middle class. Certainly, America was not a land of hereditary aristocracy. Rather, it was a place where wealth alone could elevate one's standing. And the founding fathers themselves were instrumental in rejecting monarchy and hereditary aristocracy as they structured the nation's governance. For this, their intellectual inspirations were varied. First, they took cues from Europe's first written constitution, the Magna Carta, celebrating its challenge to monarchical authority. Men like the future third US President Thomas Jefferson saw the new American elite as a natural aristocracy, one founded not on birthright, but on merit and ability. For example, Alexander Hamilton, born out of wedlock and hailing from humble beginnings in the Caribbean, or Benjamin Franklin, a son of a candle maker, could ascend to the pinnacle of American society through sheer grit and intellect. By contrast, Germany, the ancestral home of the Astors, was a veritable mosaic of principalities and kingdoms, each underpinned by its own rigid aristocratic structure. Indeed, the Astors could never have ascended the social ladder in their German homeland as they did in America's more fluid society. Thus, as the early 1800s unfurled, America was a land of disparate centers of wealth and influence. Both new money and old money mingled, yet there was no centralized high society. Therefore, America was, at the time, a vacuum that would soon draw in the likes of the entrepreneurial Astors. Now, in a nation still forming its identity, John Jacob Astor emerged as an archetype of American capitalism. Born in Germany, he crossed the Atlantic to establish himself as a fur trader and soon became America's first multimillionaire. Specifically, Astor's arrival in New York in 1786 marked the dawn of his business endeavors. Acquiring knowledge of the fur trade during his voyage to the New World, he opened a fur goods shop in Manhattan. And Astor was not one to squander an opportunity. The Jay Treaty of 1794, which opened new Canadian markets and the Great Lakes region, proved fortuitous for him. His shrewd negotiations with native tribes and market insights allowed him to accumulate a quarter of a million dollars by the year 1800, effectively crowning him the undisputed magnate of the fur trade. But John Jacob Astor's ventures were not confined to furs alone. In 1834, the Astor House, New York City's first luxury hotel, welcomed its first guests. Astor had meticulously gathered parcels of land around his previous residence, effectively claiming an entire city block in what was then the city's most elegant quarter. Situated on the west side of Broadway, the Astor House was a stone's throw away from City Hall Park and the offices of the New York Herald. For decades, this establishment remained the lodestar for the elite and the famous, the venue where authors and statesmen mingled in opulent settings. Indeed, it served as the blueprint for the city's future luxurious accommodations. Now, the patriarch of the Astor dynasty passed away in 1848, leaving a staggering $20 million, equal to over $770 million in today's currency, almost all of which was bequeathed to his son, William Backhouse Astor. Thus, the provisions of Astor's will were carefully engineered to preserve the family fortune for the generations to follow, a symbol of his calculating mind. 
By the 1850s, the Astor family had transcended their mercantile origins to become social arbiters of the First Order. And it was Caroline Shermerhorn Astor, William's wife, who most personified this new societal influence. The famed matriarch wielded almost dictatorial control over New York high society, and it was her annual Astor Ball that became the defining event of the city's social calendar. Now, during the 1870s, Caroline Astor, commonly known as the Mrs. Astor, wielded significant influence over American high society. Her Fifth Avenue mansion became the stage for defining the era's social etiquettes, where she hosted elaborate teas, receptions, and opulent late-night dinners. The pinnacle of her social calendar was an annual ball, set meticulously on a Monday night in January, where dinner was served at 11 p.m., and dancing continued until the break of day. Mrs. Astor would commonly be flanked by Ward McAllister, her confidant and co-architect of social exclusivity. Together, they orchestrated the Society of the Patriarchs, a club aimed at consolidating the creme de la creme of New York society. Now, the Patriarchs' balls were recurring events, held multiple times each season at Delmonico's, the city's premier dining establishment. Membership in the society came with certain privileges. Each member could extend invitations to five women and four men for the various social events conceptualized by Caroline Astor. Those who met the society's stringent standards were granted entry into the 400, a term coined to represent the elite list of guests who could comfortably fit in Mrs. Astor's ballroom. This exclusive list included individuals of impeccable lineage, grandchildren of past presidents, European royalty, and heirs to monumental fortunes. Indeed, the 400 became synonymous with social exclusivity, setting the tone for who was considered in and out of the upper echelons of American society. Meanwhile, in 1887, Lewis Keller, a society columnist and golf aficionado, published the first social register, taking a cue from Mrs. Astor's famous 400 list. His compilation also included names from other notable lists, effectively documenting those who made up New York's most distinguished visiting registers. Overseen by an anonymous advisory committee, the social register initially recorded over 5,000 individuals, many of whom were descendants of early American settlers. Historically, the list catered to American upper-class families, epitomizing the WASP stereotype. Amid this backdrop of social curating, tensions flared between the Astors and the Vanderbilts, the two titan families of the Gilded Age. Alva Vanderbilt, slighted for her absence on Mrs. Astor's coveted list, orchestrated an audacious counter-move. In 1883, after the completion of Petit Chateau, her extravagant Fifth Avenue residence, Alva dispatched 1,200 invitations for her masked ball. Hearing all the society chatter, Mrs. Astor's daughter, eager to attend the Vanderbilt Gala, thus persuaded her mother to pay a visit to Alva. Armed with a useful excuse to finally acknowledge the Vanderbilt's entry into high society, Mrs. Astor joined in Alva's festivities, marking a twisted tale of social rivalry in a setting already steeped in exclusivity and one-upmanship. Now, the Astor-led High Society annual social cycle of Gilded Age New York commenced in November and extended until the onset of Lent. During spring, society's finest would frequent the courts of England and Europe, only to return for a stateside summer. This recurring sequence of events, including balls and dinner parties, was not just a social fixture, but also held political relevance, as many members of the US Parliament partook in these social rites. Subsequently, Caroline Astor, partnered with her confidant Ward McAllister, aimed to formalize the rules governing this rarefied social landscape. They were the self-appointed guardians of old money propriety, laboring to sift the worthy from the unworthy newcomers. However, simultaneously, as the American Astor family's influence was reaching its apogee in the United States, an ocean away, the family's tendrils were extending into British society. In 1893, William Waldorf Astor, disenchanted by familial discord on American soil, took up residence in England. And the estate of Cliveden in Taplow, Buckinghamshire, once the province of the Duke of Westminster, soon became the Astor's palatial refuge. Then in 1906, as if anointing the Union of Continents, William Waldorf bestowed Cliveden upon his son, Waldorf Astor, and his new American bride, Nancy Langhorne. Nancy Langhorne hailed from Virginia, 
born into fluctuating fortunes that eventually swelled by the close of the 19th century. Thus, her marriage to Waldorf in 1906 was something of an international alliance, not only merging family wealth, but also social ambitions. With political aspirations in his eyes and the influence of his well-connected wife, Waldorf became the unionist candidate for Plymouth in 1908. Nancy, ever the devoted spouse, campaigned ardently at his side until he took his seat in Parliament two years later. And British society warmed to Nancy, captivated by her American ebullience and sharp wit. Thus, in Albion, the Astors were a harmonious pair, both American expatriates of similar temperament. Remarkably, they were even born on the same day, the 19th of May, 1879. As hostess of Cliveden, Nancy became renowned, drawing luminaries from Charlie Chaplin and George Bernard Shaw to Winston Churchill into their social sphere. Then, in 1919, an unforeseen twist of fate. Waldorf was elevated to the House of Lords, necessitating his departure from the House of Commons. Into the vacuum stepped Nancy, who won his seat and made history as the first woman to sit in Parliament. Over a span of 26 years, she wielded her influence in the advocacy of diverse causes, shortened working hours, enhanced health care for mothers, pensions for widows, and equal employment opportunities for women. But Virginia always occupied a special place in her heart. A portrait believed to depict Pocahontas was her gift to the Commonwealth in 1926. However, despite her groundbreaking career, Nancy encountered formidable resistance, including from none other than Winston Churchill, Yet her tenure in Parliament set a precedent that reverberated through the halls of power, unsettling traditional gender norms and shaping a new pathway for women in politics. Simultaneously, her wealth, social standing and vast network of connections became essential assets in her political endeavours. Therefore, while the family maintained a formidable presence in American high society, the British chapter of the Astor legacy was inscribing itself. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s, Waldorf and Nancy became staples in the British social fabric. Cliveden was not just their home, but an international salon of intellect, influence and elegance. Nancy, the hostess with an unyielding political spirit, was perceived as among the world's most notable women. Cliveden, the epitome of their transatlantic melding of societies, continued to be the stage for this remarkable American-British drama. But as the fur trade, once a cornerstone of Astor prosperity, dwindled and real estate ventures faced turbulence in an evolving urban landscape, the family found their once impervious status diminishing. Now, the ebbing of the Astor family's fortunes was a gradual process that spanned the late 19th to the 20th century, catalyzed by shifting economic terrains and societal perceptions, and accusations of being slumlords further marred their standing. A maritime calamity, the sinking of the Titanic, cemented a regrettably certain end to the Astor Dominion in New York society. Among the ship's casualties was John Jacob Astor IV, the most affluent passenger aboard. His wife, Madeline Force Astor, survived the tragedy and subsequently gave birth to their son, John Jacob Astor VI, and Madeline herself was a figure of social intrigue. Her marriage to John Jacob Astor IV having provoked scandal due to their age difference and his recent divorce. When several clergy members refused to officiate their wedding, the minister who eventually stepped in faced such backlash that he felt compelled to resign. Decades later, as World War II erupted, the Astor influence across the Atlantic saw another significant recalibration. Nancy Astor, now the Viscountess Astor, was deeply engaged in political life and philanthropy throughout the conflict yet her political standing eroded over the course of the war. Believing her party and husband considered her a liability, she retired from politics in 1945. And World War II itself wrought significant changes on the British home front, including the mobilization of women into various forms of labor, yet it did little to modernize their post-war ambitions, which largely remained anchored in tradition. In the next decade, the 1950s, the divestment of American assets signified another phase in the family's retrenchment. John Jacob Astor VI, who was born in the shadow of the Titanic disaster, had overseen the Astor estate in Basking Ridge. But in 1960, he abandoned this property. It laid vacant until its acquisition by Bernard's Township in 1968 for $140,000. Furthermore, the wane of the Astor influence during the latter half of the 20th century 
symbolized a broader societal shift. The concept of high society, once the near-exclusive realm of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, began to diversify, making room for emergent families like the Irish Catholic Kennedys. Yet, the Astor legacy is far from erased, and it persists through philanthropic works such as the New York Public Library, a variety of New York City landmarks and streets, and titles that remain with the family's English descendants, including Viscount Astor and Baron Astor of Hever. Cleveland, Ohio, on the brink of the 19th century. A collage of hardy souls, undaunted dreams, and fierce determination. It's here, treading through the thunder of steel on rail and the symphony of industry piercing the crisp Midwestern sky, where our story begins. We meet a young John D. Rockefeller, a man not born great, but upon whom greatness would be bestowed by the trials of life. Young John's eyes reflect an old soul, a wisdom gifted by his devout mother, Eliza Davison. A pillar of steadfast religious faith, she has imparted in her son the invaluable lessons of charity, frugality, and financial stewardship. In the muted glow of candlelight, John faithfully absorbed these lessons, his handwritten ledger of daily expenditures a constant companion. However, even as he wrote, his father's shadow filled the room. His father, William Avery Rockefeller, a man with a chameleon-like charm and a penchant for high stakes, peddled his miracle potions. Blending a mix of naive hope and snake oil, he sold dreams to the desperate and unsuspecting. This tension, an intricate waltz between integrity and deception, forms the foundation of the Rockefeller family's destiny. Each moment adds a new layer of resolve. The quiet diligence from a mother's teachings and the ruthless business cunning kindled by a father's guile. Embark with us on this journey from the freshly minted wealth of the new money Rockefellers to the prestigious old money dynasty John would build as we describe. How the Rockefeller family went from new money to old money. Our saga begins in New York State, where our pivotal protagonist, John D. Rockefeller, first experienced life's trials and triumphs. Raised by his devout Baptist mother, Eliza Davison, Rockefeller learned the virtues of charity, frugality, and the effective management of money from an early age. This foundational training would later become the bedrock of his extraordinary business acumen. However, to fully comprehend the twists and turns of this familial odyssey from rags to riches, we must introduce an almost Dickensian character, John Dee's father, William Avery Rockefeller. Far from the righteous path his wife tread, William Avery lived a life of flamboyant ruses. As a traveling salesman, he peddled miracle potions with the grand promise of healing any affliction, from insignificant ailments to terminal diseases. Astoundingly, the key ingredient of these elixirs was petroleum, a substance that, unbeknownst to young John, would power his future, paving his way towards becoming America's first billionaire. William Avery, however, bore a less than reputable reputation. He was a man of questionable integrity, dabbling in horse thievery and habitually tangling with the law. His unorthodox antics eventually led to a forced relocation to Cleveland, Ohio, a move that uprooted young Rockefeller from his childhood home in upstate New York. Eliza Rockefeller, a figure of steadfast faith and resilience, stood as the counterpoint to William Avery's volatile lifestyle. Eliza's devout religiosity played a significant role in shaping young John D. Rockefeller's worldview, infusing his business strategies with a sense of moral responsibility and ethical diligence that would remain with him throughout his life. Now, despite William Avery's dubious character, he surprisingly harbored a staunch belief in the power of education. As such, he enrolled John D. and his brother William at Cleveland Central High School, the country's first free public high school west of the Allegheny Mountains. This experience instilled a strong sense of independence in John D., particularly during his father's frequent, lengthy absences. And remarkably, these absences were not without their silver lining. When he did indeed return, William Avery's penchant for deception extended to his own son, with John D.'s father himself once bragging, I cheat my boys every chance I get. I want to make them sharp. This unconventional paternal approach, however, inadvertently honed Rockefeller's business instincts. His early exposure to his father's swindles molded him into a shrewd negotiator, a business hawk with an eagle eye for spotting potential pitfalls and deceptive maneuvers in the commercial arena. The motherly figure of Eliza Davison, however, was the enduring, guiding beacon in John Dee's life. Over the course of his life, 
he progressively distanced himself from his father, while his mother's influence and memory only amplified. Her teachings left an indelible mark on Rockefeller, who would go on to recall, From the beginning, I was trained to work, to save, and to give. Upon completion of his education, Rockefeller, now seasoned with both life and business experience, found his heart's delight in his high school sweetheart, Laura Spellman, marking the close of one eventful chapter and the dawn of another in his remarkable journey. John D. Rockefeller's business journey, one marked by scrupulous financial acumen and towering ambition, began in September 1855, when at just 16, he entered the business world as an assistant bookkeeper for a small produce commission firm, Hewitt and Tuttle in Cleveland. Even then, his meticulous nature shone through, keeping detailed ledgers that accounted for every cent in his possession. A staunch advocate of charity, Rockefeller adhered to the concept of tithing from his earliest days of earning income for himself, committing 10% of his earnings to charitable causes. In 1859, Rockefeller partnered with Morris B. Clark, launching a produce commission business. They raised $4,000, more than $100,000 in today's dollars, a sizable capital for the time. The Civil War period proved lucrative, as the Union Army's demand for supplies soared. However, it was towards the end of the conflict, as the prospect of wartime profits faded, that Rockefeller and Clark turned their attention towards oil refining. The true turning point came in 1866, when John's brother, William Rockefeller Jr., built another refinery in Cleveland, pulling John into the partnership. In 1867, Henry Morrison Flagler joined them, establishing Rockefeller, Andrews and Flagler, which rapidly grew to be the world's largest oil refinery. This operation laid the foundation for Standard Oil, officially formed on January 10, 1870, which embarked on an aggressive campaign to consolidate the oil market. Known as the Cleveland Conquest or the Cleveland Massacre, Standard Oil in less than four months in 1872 absorbed 22 of its 26 Cleveland competitors. By 1880, Standard Oil controlled approximately 90% of all oil refineries and pipelines in the United States, allowing Rockefeller to effectively dictate the entire industry's pace and direction. However, Rockefeller's strategies were not without benefits for the public. Before 1870, only the affluent could afford oil light, provided by expensive whale oil. However, in the following decade, thanks to the economies of scale realized by Standard Oil, kerosene became widely accessible to the working and middle classes. Yet these business practices, including underselling, differential pricing, and secret transportation rebates, also invited controversy. And by 1880, Standard Oil was reported by the media as the most cruel, impudent, pitiless and grasping monopoly that ever fastened upon a country. The intense criticism led to the creation of the Standard Oil Trust in 1882, a corporation of corporations, to centralize Rockefeller's holdings, which further stirred public suspicion. Despite these challenges, Standard Oil stood resilient, consistently making profits year after year, achieving an aura of invincibility and unparalleled wealth. Ida Tarbell, a journalist, would ultimately lead a movement to challenge this behemoth. Her meticulous investigation, culminating in a series of damning articles, exposed Standard Oil's ruthless tactics and ultimately contributed to the dissolution of Standard Oil as a monopoly, leading to the Clayton Antitrust Act. Without fully throwing in the towel, Rockefeller started looking at his transition into retirement while still seeking to preserve his wealth and transform his new money into the more enduring old money. He diversified his investments and launched the Rockefeller Foundation in 1913 with an initial donation of $100 million, broadening his legacy beyond oil and industry, highlighting his commitment to philanthropy. However, his rise from a new money tycoon to an old money patriarch was marred by personal challenges and public scorn, with some speculating that the relentless scrutiny caused Rockefeller to develop alopecia. Despite these obstacles, the name Rockefeller had a journey from poverty to the patriarch of one of America's most powerful families that was only just beginning as he passed control of his dynasty to the next generation. Now, John D. Rockefeller was not merely an astute businessman, he was also an ardent practitioner of old money principles, such as long-term financial planning, privacy, understated elegance, philanthropy, and thrift. These were the values he instilled in his children ensuring the Rockefeller legacy would span generations. 
In contrast to the new money families of the Gilded Age, the Rockefellers adopted a more discreet and sustainable approach to wealth. Consider the Vanderbilt and Gould families, prominent figures of the Gilded Age whom epitomized new money opulence. Cornelius Vanderbilt, renowned for his empire of steamships and the New York Central Railroad, celebrated his fortune with a flourish. The manifestation of his wealth was particularly evident in his family's real estate purchases. The family commissioned grand mansions that showcased their affluence, such as the opulent Vanderbilt mansions on Fifth Avenue, which stood as symbols of their enormous wealth. These included the Triple Palace, a trio of residences designed by famed architects and decorated with marble, gold, and other precious materials. In addition to these residences, Cornelius Vanderbilt II acquired an expensive townhouse on 57th Street, which later had to be sold due to financial strain. Additionally, the Marble House, built by William Kissam Vanderbilt in Newport, Rhode Island, was another display of the Vanderbilt fortune. This lavish mansion, however, was eventually sold due to its exorbitant upkeep costs. Their penchant for grandeur extended to their social events as well, with the Vanderbilt Costume Ball of 1883, a million-dollar spectacle, immortalizing their penchant for lavish spending. However, the Vanderbilt's unchecked extravagance combined with their neglect of long-term financial planning, ultimately led to the erosion of their substantial fortune. This financial mismanagement left many of their descendants grappling with relative poverty, a stark contrast to their forebears' opulence. Similarly, the Gould family, led by railroad magnate Jay Gould, failed to preserve their wealth across generations. Jay Gould was famed for his extravagant lifestyle, evident in his creation of Lyndhurst, a sprawling Gothic revival mansion. His offspring mirrored his extravagance, erecting impressive residences such as a castle-like mansion in Lakewood, New Jersey, and a French chateau-inspired mansion in Tarrytown, New York. However, the Goulds mirrored the Vanderbilts in their lack of emphasis on sustained wealth management. George J. Gould II and J. Gould II, descendants of this once affluent lineage, pursued commendable careers, yet the family fortune dwindled over time. After George J. Gould's demise, their once formidable wealth had practically evaporated, resulting in their descendants leading lives far from their opulent heritage. Today, the Vanderbilt and Gould legacies serve as potent reminders of the impermanence of wealth without prudent stewardship. The next generation of Rockefellers, however, took a different path, rooted in the old money traditions of privacy, thrift, and philanthropy. These principles played out vividly in the lives of John D. Rockefeller Sr.'s children. John D. Rockefeller Jr., the only son and the primary heir, inherited not only his father's vast fortune, but also his commitment to philanthropy. He financed the construction of the Rockefeller Center in New York and restored Colonial Williamsburg, among many other philanthropic endeavors. Yet, despite his eye-watering size of income, he lived a relatively modest lifestyle, avoiding public displays of wealth and maintaining a strong focus on his family. Similarly, Rockefeller's daughters also embodied the old money principles. Elizabeth, the eldest, married a banker and led a private life out of the public eye. Alice, despite suffering from various health issues throughout her life, was known for her philanthropy and carried the family tradition of supporting educational and health causes. Alta, the third child, married a scientist and focused her efforts on supporting scientific research. Edith, the youngest, devoted herself to music and philanthropy, continuing the family's commitment to giving back to society. However, embodying old money principles did not exempt the Rockefeller children from difficulties. John D. Rockefeller Jr., for instance, was often criticized for his ruthless business practices, just like his father. Similarly, Alice struggled with her health, suffering from various illnesses throughout her life. The public scrutiny that came with the Rockefeller name was also a constant source of stress for the family. Yet despite these challenges, the old money principles continued to guide them. The Rockefeller children, following their father's example, sought to preserve their wealth for future generations, focusing on long-term financial planning rather than short-term gain. They understood the importance of privacy, choosing to live away from the public eye. They embraced understated elegance and avoided the ostentatious displays of wealth common among new money families. The financial landscape of America's Gilded Age was indeed a volatile crucible, with fortunes being made and lost almost overnight. Within this climate, a distinction arose between new money the freshly minted wealth of entrepreneurs and industrialists, 
and old money, the inherited wealth of established families that had accumulated assets over generations. The terms encapsulated more than just the age of wealth. They signified cultural differences, social acceptability, and the capacity for wealth preservation. The Rockefellers, beginning as new money, were no strangers to this volatility. However, their pragmatic approach to wealth accumulation and preservation arguably allowed them to transition into the esteemed category of old money. Key to this transformation was their ability to integrate into high society and form strategic alliances through marriage. The family made insightful choices in matrimony, aligning themselves with well-established families through advantageous marriages. John D. Rockefeller Jr., the sole son of John D. Rockefeller Sr., set the pace in 1901 when he married Abby Aldrich. Abby wasn't just any bride. She was the daughter of U.S. Senator Nelson W. Aldrich, a political powerhouse whose influence stretched from Wall Street to Washington. The Aldrich family had a strong political lineage, and this marital alliance thrust the Rockefellers into significant political circles, offering them not just social prominence, but also a chance to influence policy. Their progeny, representing the third generation of the Rockefellers, adopted this pattern of strategically beneficial marriages. In 1930, Nelson Rockefeller, later to become the Vice President of the United States, married Mary Todd Hunter Clark. Mary came from an esteemed Philadelphia family known for its quiet yet significant influence in the city's legal and civic affairs. These unions were not solely about the joining of two individuals, but rather about the confluence of power, influence, and long-standing family heritage. The Rockefellers also distinguished themselves through public service and philanthropy. As previously noted, Nelson held the high office of Vice President under President Gerald Ford, reinforcing the family's presence in the nation's political sphere. Simultaneously, his brother Lawrence carved out a niche as a venture capitalist and passionate conservationist, contributing to the preservation of natural habitats and environmental sustainability. Continuing the family's trajectory in public service, John D. Rockefeller IV, more commonly called Jay, Nelson's nephew and a fourth-generation Rockefeller, built a significant political career. Born in 1937, Jay served as West Virginia's Secretary of State and later as the state's governor, impressively holding office from 1977 to 1985. In 1984, he was elected to the United States Senate, serving five terms until he decided not to seek re-election in 2014. As a senator, Jay championed issues such as healthcare reform and internet privacy, thus maintaining the family's tradition of public service. Additionally, embedded in the core of the Rockefeller family's legacy is their remarkable philanthropy. The Rockefellers became known as patrons of education and the arts, helping to shape America's cultural landscape. They lent their considerable resources to institutions such as the University of Chicago and the Museum of Modern Art. This deep-rooted philanthropy wasn't simply about donating money, it was an essential tool for shaping their public persona, showcasing their commitment to societal advancement. Yet alongside this is their equally noteworthy ability to amass and preserve substantial wealth. This duality reflects the character of John D. Rockefeller himself, who was known to be a ruthless businessman, yet an incredibly generous philanthropist. Their philanthropic ventures were strategic. They served to not only improve public welfare, but also to bolster their societal standing, assisting in their seamless transition from new money to old money. Through these actions, the Rockefellers were not just cementing their place within societal elites, but also highlighting their dedication to the public good. Therefore, simultaneously, the Rockefellers adopted several strategies to safeguard their wealth, ensuring that it would endure across generations. One significant step in this regard was the establishment of the Rockefeller Foundation in 1913. This move was more than an act of charity. It was a calculated effort to shield their wealth from heavy estate taxes, thereby allowing it to grow and benefit society simultaneously. Over time, the Foundation's immense contributions to public health, education and arts helped to further establish and fortify the Rockefeller name. Trusts also played a critical role in their wealth preservation strategy. John D. Rockefeller Sr. formed his first trust in 1891, transferring a significant portion of his fortune to it. This move offered both tax advantages and protection against potential heirs' mismanagement, thereby ensuring the continuity of the Rockefeller fortune. In addition, the Rockefellers innovatively used holding companies to manage their diverse business interests. 
These corporate structures provided a protective shield for their wealth, while also promoting growth. This use of corporate entities set a precedent for future wealthy families, showing how wealth could be protected and multiplied simultaneously. As such, the Rockefellers are a perfect example of how one family managed to become synonymous with philanthropy while maintaining an iron grip on their wealth, demonstrating a duality that has become part of their enduring legacy. In the opening years of the 20th century, the Rockefeller dynasty stood as an unassailable pillar of American affluence and influence. Furthermore, their palatial estates sprawled across prominent landscapes from the bustling heart of New York to the sun-kissed shores of Florida and the opulent retreats in Newport. These were not merely homes, but grandiose statements of wealth and architectural prowess. However, the looming shadow of the Great Depression would come to eclipse even these illustrious sanctuaries, compelling the family to part with many of their treasured possessions. In today's episode of Old Money Mansions, we'll guide you through the riveting narrative of these lost Rockefeller mansions, telling the full saga of why these lavish homes were relinquished, what transpired in the aftermath of their sales, and whether the parting was a mere financial exigency, or an emblematic shift in the American social class system. First on our list we enter the John D. Rockefeller mansion. But first, a quick history lesson. You see, in the 1860s, amidst the chaos of the Civil War, Fifth Avenue and 54th Street in Manhattan remained a barren stretch of land, until William P. Williams, a prosperous merchant, would choose this location to construct a lavish brownstone mansion at 4 West 54th Street in 1864. Indeed, the mansion was an elegant abode, an embodiment of Williams's prosperity and an early marker of the neighborhood's potential. Simultaneously, in the southern charm of Richmond, Virginia, Catherine Yarrington managed a boarding house to support her family following her husband's demise. Among her five children was a 19-year-old Arabella, a young woman who radiated beauty and had a penchant for inviting drama into her life. Her life took a significant turn when Collis P. Huntington, a married New York railroad magnate, initiated a passionate relationship with her. Subsequently, the Yarrington clan relocated to the Big Apple in 1869. After this, Arabella soon had a child, Archer Worsham, whose paternity was a subject of much gossip. The general consensus, though unverified, was that Archer was indeed Huntington's son. With a newfound financial cushion, Arabella secured the brownstone mansion at 4 West 54th Street. Though the home showed signs of architectural aging, she was thrilled. It was situated in one of Manhattan's most coveted districts. However, Arabella yearned for something more than mere high society prestige. She envisioned a complete metamorphosis, not just of her social standing, but also her living space. Money being no hindrance, she spearheaded a full-scale renovation, employing top-notch decorating firms of the time, such as George A. Shasti or Potier and Stymus. Stepping into Arabella's home was like entering a realm of fantasies. It boasted a Turkish bath, a Japanese bedroom with ebonized woodwork, and a dazzling chandelier crafted in silver and gilt. The smoking room was a spectacle of Moorish charm. Ceilings featured intricate designs, mantles showcased exotic woodwork. While artisans labored to perfect each detail, Arabella and her young son ventured on international excursions, returning to an abode completely altered in both form and spirit. Yet Arabella, always the shrewd entrepreneur, decided to sell the mansion following her husband's death. John D. Rockefeller, the legendary oil tycoon, would soon acquire the property, marking the inception of another chapter in the mansion's storied existence. Sadly, its architectural splendor was not universally appreciated. John D. Rockefeller Jr. salvaged two rooms for museums in New York, but the rest of the house faced the wrecking ball, unable to align with modern architectural sensibilities. The final act for the mansion came when Abby Rockefeller, John's spouse, co-established the Museum of Modern Art Sculpture Garden on its grounds. The mansion's rich and multifaceted past gradually receded, marking the end of a unique chapter in the story of Victorian domestic architecture. At the number two slot in our historic inventory, Rockwood Hall emerges as a paragon of the Gilded Age, a remarkable residence in Mount Pleasant, New York. Established in 1849, the mansion's lineage included distinguished individuals such as Alexander Slidell Mackenzie and William Henry Aspinwall. However, its transformation into a veritable palace occurred under the ownership of William Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller's brother. 
William expanded the mansion to an awe-inspiring 204 rooms, establishing it as the second largest private residence in America during his lifetime. And the architectural grandeur of Rockwood Hall didn't just remain confined within its walls, it served as the conceptual blueprint for the Sacred Heart Academy in Cincinnati, Ohio. Designed by Thomas Sargent, this academy took shape between 1864 and 1867 as the residence of William C. Neff. As years rolled on and the Rockefellers' influence waned, the mansion experienced a shift in purpose. Transformed into a country club, it eventually spiraled into bankruptcy amid the financial ruin of the Great Depression. Subsequently, John D. Rockefeller Jr. gained control of the property, demolishing a majority of the mansion in 1942. Before its incorporation into Rockefeller State Park Preserve, the mansion passed through a series of custodians, including tech giant IBM. What remains today is but a fragment of its former self, a nostalgic gatehouse and terraced foundations, remnants that tell the tale of an age of luxury and ambition along the Hudson River. Architectural features that set Rockwood Hall apart included a towering four-story structure at the mansion's southeast corner, a two-and-a-half-story octagonal tower, and an elegant porte cochere that seamlessly connected the two. The mansion reveled in lavish verandas and a stone-roofed patio that hugged its perimeter. Its roof was a work of art, adorned with red-tiled firebrick and crowned with an ornate gilded weather vane. Inside, the mansion was an epitome of finery. The first floor was a microcosm of opulence, home to an entrance hall, drawing room, library, music room, and various other chambers designed for leisure and refinement. Mosaic floors, walls crafted from American oak, and intricately designed papier-mâché ceilings greeted the eye at every turn. The grand staircase, adorned with an American oak balustrade, was a spectacle unto itself, crowned by a glorious dome of cathedral glass. But its innovations weren't limited to visual aesthetics. Advanced features like floorboard vents for heating and electric buttons for calling servants imbued the mansion with a forward-thinking sensibility. Fire safety was paramount, as evidenced by fireproof construction and sliding doors in nearly all rooms. Additionally, landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted complemented the mansion's structural beauty with lush external environs. Rolling hills, scenic woodlands, meadows, and artistically designed gardens enriched the mansion's surrounding acreage. Today, Rockwood Hall remains an evocative relic, a cherished vestige of an age of unprecedented luxury and technological advancement, where the whispers of a grand past are carried by the Hudson River breezes through what remains of its noble structure. Nestled in the lush landscapes of Harnett County, North Carolina, Overhills holds the third spot on our roster. Once an expansive 17,000-acre haven, it was a cherished jewel in the Rockefeller family estate. Over time, it evolved, embodying a range of roles and interpretations. Now the architectural panorama of Overhills was a spectacle in and of itself. Here we delve into some of the cornerstone edifices that mark this verdant enclave. First, the Croatan Cottage, a stately two-story colonial revival residence. Croatan Cottage was the epitome of architectural prowess. Created by the distinguished New York design firm Hiss & Weeks, it instantly became a landmark in Overhills. The residence boasted a sprawling layout, complete with a flagstone terrace, an informal garden, and unobstructed vistas of the adjoining golf course, capturing the essence of Gilded Age grandiosity. Next, the original clubhouse of the estate was more than just a building. It was the social hub, designed to cater to the indulgences of the elite who graced Overhills. While its precise architectural elements might be varied, the overarching ethos was consistent, a blend of period-specific charm and timeless elegance. Additionally, scattered across the property were an assortment of lodges and cottages, each contributing a unique architectural nuance. Designed with meticulous attention to detail, these accommodations seamlessly integrated with the natural environment while providing the pinnacle of comfort to visitors. The estate showcased a variety of architectural styles, resonating both with the Rockefeller family's preferences and the prevailing design norms. Among these, the colonial revival style was particularly dominant, identifiable by its grand columns and symmetrical arrangements. However, Overhills was also a melting pot of architectural influences, incorporating a multiplicity of styles that added layers of complexity to its visual appeal. While not a building, the Donald Ross-designed golf course was another art form manifest in the estate. 
The course was a masterpiece, intricately laid out to offer golf enthusiasts an unparalleled experience. From the strategic bunkering to the well-contoured greens, every facet of the course was a calculated design choice, woven into the scenic backdrop of Overhills. Far more than its architectural features, Overhills possessed an undercurrent of deep historical resonance. Over the decades, its identity transitioned from a secluded haven for the Rockefellers to a significant military institution. This metamorphosis narrates a multifaceted story, marking divergent epochs in the estate's storied existence. Occupying the fourth slot in our chronicle of historical marvels is Abbeyton Lodge, originally known as the Playhouse. Nestled within the expansive grounds of the Pocantico Center, the Lodge serves as a hub for a myriad of activities and initiative, each resonating with the philanthropic spirit of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Renamed in 2018, Abbeyton Lodge embodies the values of unity and progressive philanthropy, reflecting the ambiance of the Rockefellers' early abode. Interestingly, the tale of Abbeyton Lodge finds its roots in an earlier structure of the same name. This quaint wooden establishment, gracefully situated downhill from Kikuit, the residence of John D. Rockefeller and Laura Spellman Rockefeller, marked a cherished familial gift in 1901. Picture a home adorned with oak panelling and flooring, radiating a warmth that welcomed anyone who entered its domain. For years, the lodge was the heartbeat of the Rockefeller family, a sanctuary where five sons and daughters grew, laughed, and shared life's many highs and lows. However, the tide of time turned in 1937, when the senior Rockefeller passed away. John and Abby relocated to Kikuit, leaving the original lodge largely uninhabited for nearly ten years. Despite its dormancy, the wooden edifice demanded continual maintenance. With none of the offspring returning, the lodge faced an inevitable demolition in 1946. Yet the essence of Abbeyton Lodge was too potent to be forgotten. In 1987, younger generations revived its spirit by forming Abbeyton Lodge, Incorporated, a not-for-profit entity aimed at orchestrating family gatherings and social events. But in 1924, an effort to immortalize the family legacy was undertaken by John D. Rockefeller, Jr. He enlisted architect Duncan Candler to create a playhouse, echoing the architectural elegance of the original lodge. This Tudor-style masterpiece, finished in 1927, stands as an enduring tribute to the Rockefeller family's dedication to their lineage. Inside the modern-day Abbeyton Lodge, you are greeted by a stone-floored lobby punctuated by portraits of the Rockefeller patriarch and matriarch. Further in, an intimate card room beckons, its chairs ornamented with needlepoint craftsmanship, courtesy of Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller. The indoor pool area is a feast for the eyes, its walls and floors adorned with vibrant Mexican Talavera tiles. The adjacent gallery houses a grand fireplace and architectural relics from the family's Gilded Age residence in New York City, each element contributing to the rich narrative of the space. Today, the stewardship of Abbeyton Lodge is undertaken by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, operated by the Pocantico Center under the auspices of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Bequeathed by David Rockefeller, this majestic venue continues its philanthropic mission, ensuring that its legacy will be cherished by future generations. And the final narrative in our exploration of historic mansions unfurls like a romance novel brought to life. Picture this, it's June 1924, and the SS Homeric is setting sail for the Paris Olympics. On board is James Stillman Rockefeller, the charming Yale crew team captain. While the ship offers him a rigorous practice schedule by day, it also provides resplendent dance nights to enjoy. Amidst this whirlwind of athleticism and glamour, James finds himself utterly captivated by Nancy Carnegie, a vivacious debutante and the granddaughter of steel magnate Andrew Carnegie. As fate would have it, their connection deepens against the backdrop of James's gold medal victory in rowing at Paris. Fast forward a year, and the couple's love story crescendos into a grand wedding at the Carnegie Estate on Cumberland Island, Georgia. A sprawling 11-acre plot in Greenwich, Connecticut, becomes their wedding gift and the canvas upon which they would paint their lifelong dreams. With the same spirit that guided them through their whirlwind courtship, they embarked on an architectural adventure, enlisting Auguste Noel and George McCulloch Miller, the minds behind the iconic Whitney Museum. What emerged was Rockfields, a 19,000-square-foot Georgian-style marvel dressed in rich red brick. 
Imagine soaring ceilings, multiple fireplaces, a pantheon of bedrooms, and a living room featuring expansive windows that provided panoramic views of an English boxwood garden and a wisteria-laden gazebo. As the decades turned, Rockfields bore witness to the rhythms of time. Three years following James's death in 2004, the property transitioned into the care of a financier who invigorated it with modern touches. The mansion found its next chapter in 2009 with owners enamored by aesthetics and the arts. For these stewards, the mansion's magnetic allure was palpable from the first glimpse of its winding driveway. Renovations were imminent but carefully planned. An extensive landscape overhaul introduced 53 new maple trees and a rejuvenated gazebo. In came architects Timothy Haynes and Kevin Roberts, renowned for transforming spaces into artistic marvels, and the renovations were nothing short of transformative. The foyer saw its red-orange American cherry floor give way to a checkered pattern of deep burgundy marble and cream French limestone, a nod to the grandeur of British estates. The formal dining room was reimagined with antiqued mirrored walls, enveloping the space in a soft, inviting glow. Furthermore, illumination assumes a crucial role throughout the home, and the owners, with their eclectic artistic tastes, integrated dynamic light features and vibrant panels from the Meersburg Hunts of Maximilian, a 16th century treasure. While the renovations added modern flair, they also respected the mansion's rich history, original blueprints from 1929, and a long-since deactivated telephone switchboard serve as nostalgic touchpoints. Thus, the experience of being in Rockfields is almost ethereal. Each door, heavy with the weight of history, opens to reveal corners imbued with stories from the past, making this mansion a living, breathing monument to enduring love and timeless elegance. In a grand study awash with flickering shadows, Andrew Carnegie sits at a dark mahogany desk. The room is nearly dark, save for the small circle of light cast by an ornate oil lamp. The year is 1889, and outside the window the Pittsburgh steel mills are ablaze, lighting up the night sky like the stars glimmering above the Scotsman's palatial estate. However, inside, a different kind of inferno burns. It is the fire of an idea that will change the course of American history. With a clenched jaw and eyes gleaming with resolve, Carnegie leans forward, gripping his quill as if it were a sword. As he scribbles intently, he hesitates suddenly, feeling the weight of the next sentence. After taking in a deep, reflective breath, the magnate finally writes his declaration for the ages. The man who dies rich, dies disgraced. Relieved, Carnegie puts down his pen, contemplating the magnitude of the words he has just committed to paper. It is indeed a declaration that will reverberate through generations, shaking the foundations of American capitalism. Now, in our 21st century economic climate, the concept of old money signifies not just wealth, but the enduring legacy of families who have maintained, and even greatly expanded, their fortunes for generations. But what happens when a family intentionally breaks this cycle of generational wealth and gives away their billions, on purpose, thus consciously pushing their status back down to the middle class. In this episode of Old Money Luxury, we will explore this exact enigma. Guided by the ideology of their patriarch, Andrew Carnegie, the Carnegie family went from amassing a colossal fortune that, for a time, crowned him the world's richest man, to strategically giving away more than $5.6 billion in today's currency. With that mystifying prelude as a backdrop, join us as we now recount the entire saga, and describe how the Carnegies went from old money to no money. Our journey first begins on the misty lanes of Dunfermline, Scotland, where Andrew Carnegie first saw the light of day in 1835. Born to no ordinary family, young Andrew's lineage was steeped in the humble craft of weaving, a tradition nourished by his father, William Carnegie, and his paternal grandfather. The maternal side of his family tree branched off in a different direction. Andrew's mother, Margaret Morrison Carnegie hailed from a line deeply involved in tanning and shoemaking. However, she was not merely a homemaker, but rather the daughter of George Lauder, a political stalwart who ensured young Andrew's mind was sparked by the heroics of Scottish legends like Robert the Bruce, Rob Roy and William Wallace. The Carnegie family's daily life was framed by the quaintness of their weaver's cottage and the looming presence of the Industrial Revolution a transformative period that remodeled Scotland's social fabric and economic vitality. 
Dunfermline itself was a hub of textile manufacturing, but the family's fortunes dimmed as factory systems replaced traditional handlooms. This decline subjected weavers like William Carnegie to financial hardships, casting shadows of poverty over their lives. Yet, William was not just a weaver caught in the crossfire of industrialization. He was a passionate advocate of the Chartist movement, which called for broad political and social reforms. On the other side, Margaret Morrison Carnegie's family was also politically active, adding another layer to Andrew's inherent views on social responsibility. But how did the teenaged Andrew navigate through a world shifting under his feet? The answer lies in his relentless pursuit of self-education. Formal schooling took a back seat as Andrew leaned into books and night school, supported by a family tradition that valued intellectual rigor and political activism. Libraries became his sanctuaries, thanks to Uncle George's introductions to literary masterpieces and historical narratives. These early experiences seeded his lifelong love for libraries and a philanthropic fervor to construct these reservoirs of knowledge across English-speaking countries. But Scotland's Industrial Revolution would soon not just alter the nation's economy, it would birth complex societal structures, trigger urban migration, and lead to governmental reforms. Amidst this tumult, it became clear that the Carnegie family needed to seek greener pastures, and to that the burgeoning magnetic allure of the American dream, the notion that in the United States you can make it big through sheer grit and enterprise. And we arrive at the year 1848, when the Carnegies decide to pack up their hopes and dreams, cross the Atlantic, and settle in Allegheny City, Pennsylvania. Here, they would hope to find not just economic sustenance, but a stage upon which young Andrew could shape his indomitable destiny. Now, the Carnegie family had deliberately chosen Allegheny, the budding industrial suburb of Pittsburgh, for its abundant economic prospects. During this period, in the mid-19th century, America was a crucible of change, fueled by Manifest Destiny and the California Gold Rush of 1849. The nation itself was also on the cusp of an industrial revolution, transitioning from agricultural simplicity to industrial complexity. Allegheny specifically was a mosaic of diverse communities, including Germans and Croats, and offered a plethora of job opportunities in sectors like commercial trading, meatpacking and leather tanning. However, despite these favorable conditions, the Carnegies faced initial hardships. William Carnegie's weaving business faltered, forcing 13-year-old Andrew into the laborious role of a bobbin boy in a cotton mill, where he would work 72-hour weeks for a modest $1.20 per hour, roughly $168 a month in today's currency. But not one to be confined by menial tasks, Andrew navigated through a series of roles that laid the foundation for his later empire. Positions such as messenger, secretary and telegraph operator for the Pennsylvania Railroad served as an informal education in corporate structure and strategy. His affiliation with the railroad industry was particularly instructive. It offered lessons in management and cost optimization, as well as invaluable connections with industry giants like Thomas A. Scott and J. Edgar Thompson. These associations helped Carnegie secure early ventures like the Keystone Bridge Company, critical to the railway infrastructure. Subsequently, the Civil War amplified Carnegie's already diversifying portfolio, especially with his stake in the Columbia Oil Company. The conflict skyrocketed demand for both iron and oil, boosting his profits. Although eligible for military service, he opted to pay a substitute $850, or roughly 20,000 modern dollars, to enlist in his stead, a common practice among the affluent. And by the early 1870s, Carnegie had diversified his investments across a broad spectrum. His real breakthrough came in 1873 with the recognition of Steele's untapped potential. Notably, he initiated the construction of the Edgar Thompson Works in Braddock, Pennsylvania, a groundbreaking facility introducing the Bessemer steelmaking process to America. Costing an estimated 1.2 million, or roughly $30 million in modern currency, the mill was a high-stakes bet on an unproven sector. Yet the gamble yielded significant dividends, as the facility didn't just elevate steel production standards, it fundamentally altered the fabric of American industry. In the years following, 
Carnegie further expanded and integrated his business holdings, including significant assets like the Scotia ore mines, Union iron mills and Lucy furnaces. This methodical combination of resources and production capacities set the stage for the emergence of the powerhouse that became Carnegie Steel Company in 1889. Now, by the dawn of the 1890s, Andrew Carnegie was firmly established as an industrial colossus, presiding over a domain that extended well beyond the furnaces of his steel operations. His Carnegie Steel Company was the bedrock of global steel production, redefining benchmarks for both efficiency and profit. During his financial peak, Carnegie was an indomitable force in American enterprise, amassing his immense wealth chiefly through steel production endeavors. His holdings were extensive, comprising a diverse array of investments from lucrative real estate to varied business ventures. One significant acquisition was Scotland's Skibo Castle in 1899, which he transformed into a tranquil retreat, far from the industrial hustle. You see, Carnegie's monumental success was rooted in two pillars, innovative techniques and shrewd business acumen. His playbook included various methods aimed at ensuring Carnegie Steel remained an industry leader. Vertical integration, strategic mergers, and an uncompromising attention to cost efficiency were among them. For example, vertical integration was foundational to his business approach. He took ownership of entities along different stages of the steelmaking process, from iron ore mines to railway companies. This end-to-end -end control enabled him to dramatically lower production costs while simultaneously optimizing operations for greater efficiency. His expansionary ambitions were further realized through mergers and acquisitions, notably the union of assets with H.C. Frick and Company in 1892. This move fortified the Carnegie Steel Company, giving him greater leverage over both the marketplace and the supply chain. An unwavering dedication to operational efficiency led him to adopt the Bessemer process, significantly quickening steel production while driving down costs. This made steel more affordable and accessible, altering the American landscape by facilitating the construction of bridges, skyscrapers, and expansive railway systems. However, this zeal for efficiency occasionally came at the cost of labor welfare. The introduction of cutting-edge technology and methods often preceded adequate safety measures. This tension came to a head in the Homestead Strike of 1892, a violent skirmish between workers and management that resulted in 12 deaths and created an enduring fissure between labor and leadership. Henry Clay Frick, who was the muscle of Carnegie Steel at the time, instigated the conflict through wage reductions. While Carnegie was geographically removed, quietly waiting back in Scotland, he had empowered Frick to act unilaterally, leading to a violent standoff that left an indelible scar on his otherwise storied legacy. Indeed, this harrowing incident triggered a significant self-reckoning for Carnegie, ultimately inspiring his gospel of wealth philosophy. This ideological shift diverged markedly from his peers' prevailing perspectives, emphasizing not just the ownership, but also the ethical stewardship of wealth. Published initially in 1889, the thesis proposed that affluence carried a moral duty to benefit society at large. Transitioning from theory to action, Carnegie would subsequently channel his resources into philanthropy, laying the groundwork for educational institutions, public libraries, and other community-focused entities. However, his philanthropic masterstroke would first need an exit strategy from the rough-and-tumble business world of Industrial Age America, and therefore, he would need a powerful ally to help strategically guide him out of the corridors of ruthless Gilded Age finance. Now, at the turn of the 20th century, when the American steel industry was the backbone of a rapidly modernizing economy, legendary financier and Machiavellian businessman J.P. Morgan saw an unparalleled opportunity. Steel was not just a commodity, it was the lifeblood of industrializing cities, the burgeoning auto industry, and wartime production during World War I. By acquiring Carnegie Steel, Morgan could craft the United States Steel Corporation in his image, a monolithic entity that at the time was the world's largest company. This acquisition enabled Morgan to corner the steel market and exploit the soaring demand for this vital resource. Thus, the 1901 sale of Carnegie Steel to J.P. Morgan for an astonishing $480 million, equivalent to over $13 billion in today's money, 
was more than just a business transaction. It provided Andrew Carnegie with the financial muscle to massively escalate his philanthropic activities in sync with his own moral guidelines encapsulated in his Gospel of Wealth. With this philosophy as his North Star and seemingly endless cash in the bank after the sale of his empire, Carnegie proclaimed that the affluent were morally obligated to disperse their wealth in their lifetime, and this sale armed him with the capital to make a transformative societal impact. Carnegie's subsequent largesse left an indelible mark on multiple sectors, education, peace initiatives and scientific research, to name a few. Among his most enduring contributions were the Carnegie Libraries, a global network of more than 2,500 public libraries. Indeed, his advocacy for public libraries came at an opportune moment when the American public library system was in its nascent stage, meeting the growing need for accessible knowledge. Consequently, these libraries were a catalyst for education and self-improvement across diverse populations, and they ushered in a new era of knowledge democratization. Local communities soon became the financial pillars of these libraries, providing about 80% of public funding. Furthermore, Carnegie's focus on libraries spurred a ripple effect, inspiring other local philanthropists to invest in their communities. These libraries were not just buildings filled with books, they were innovation hubs that enriched their localities and continue to serve their communities today. Beyond libraries, Carnegie's financial legacy led to the founding of educational behemoths like Carnegie Mellon University, an institution renowned for its contributions to science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Additionally, Carnegie Hall in New York City stands as an emblem of his patronage in the arts. This iconic concert venue has been a stage for countless musical legends and continues to uphold its reputation as an architectural and cultural jewel. However, the sale of Carnegie Steel also had ramifications for Carnegie's personal fortune. In keeping with his views on wealth dispersion, Carnegie systematically drained nearly all of his family's financial reservoirs. Now, in 1919, Andrew Carnegie's death led to a circumspect distribution of his considerable assets, personal belongings, a financial endowment, and real estate properties, among them a New York City townhouse and a Scottish vacation home. His spouse, Louise Whitfield Carnegie, a New York native, had encountered Andrew at the age of 23, thanks to her father. The two marked in 1887 at an intimate ceremony, subsequent to Louise signing a prenuptial contract that waived any future claim on Andrew's wealth. And Louise, frequently depicted as a person of kindness and moral caliber, had a prominent role in Andrew's altruistic pursuits as a board member of the Carnegie Corporation. Following Andrew's demise, she remained an active participant in the family's philanthropic ventures. Margaret Carnegie Miller, their sole child, inherited a modest trust fund, compelling the family to part with the Manhattan residents due to maintenance expenses. Born and raised in New York City, Margaret wed Roswell Miller Jr. in 1919. They had four offspring before their marriage disintegrated in 1953. Margaret served on the board of the Carnegie Corporation from 1934 until 1973 and remained an honorary trustee for life until her passing in 1990. Now, the 13 subsequent descendants of Andrew Carnegie have not accumulated billionaire status, but have thrived within the financial bracket of accomplished middle class to upper middle class professionals. Investments in diverse sectors like real estate and technology have been judiciously managed. Philanthropy, too, is an enduring family hallmark. William Thompson, a great-grandson, exemplifies this having navigated personal setbacks, such as his mother Louise's polio, to perpetuate the family's charitable legacy. As former chair and honorary president of the Carnegie UK Trust, he oversaw the yearly allocation of £1 million to assorted causes. Admirably, in the 21st century era of intense public scrutiny, and a mass media obsession with wealth, the Carnegies have kept impressively low profiles. Thorough internet searches on their lives reveal little. Social media platforms are devoid of family references, to the point where it's unlikely you'll find pictures of, or even the full names of, many living Carnegie family members. Such obscurity is indeed cultivated and cherished by this legendary clan, reflecting their old money ethos that prioritizes discretion over publicity.
where new money types may seek public affirmation through visible philanthropy or social media, the Carnegies exemplify different ethics. They have opted for a near-invisible public persona, contrasting sharply with the transparent lifestyles common among contemporary wealthy individuals. The preservation of privacy has thus become a family trait, and it adds another dimension to an already multifaceted family narrative. Andrew Carnegie was a public figure, but his heirs have largely retreated from the spotlight and the headlines, exemplifying a thoughtful navigation between the twin demands of affluence and social responsibility in today's world. In a dimly lit, hushed room swirling with cigar smoke, J.P. Morgan sat like a king on his throne, emanating an aura of unassailable power. Across from him, political candidate William McKinley's face was etched with lines of worry and exhaustion, visibly burdened by the sinking reality that his presidential dreams could soon disintegrate into dust. The year was 1896, and America stood at a political precipice. You see, McKinley's campaign was gasping for financial life, teetering on the edge of insolvency. Sensing the moment's gravity, Morgan unceremoniously produced a staggering check, instantly lifting the weight from McKinley's shoulders and infusing newfound hope into his weary eyes. With that monumental financial lifeline, Morgan didn't just rescue McKinley's campaign, he essentially bought himself a president. Indeed, the sheer audacity of the act is mind-boggling. Imagine a single private citizen with the clout and resources to effectively install a US president, forever cementing his influence into the core of the American establishment. However, in some ways, Morgan wasn't an anomaly, but rather the crowning jewel in a lineage whose name has become an awe-inspiring symbol of American affluence and dominion. For over two centuries, the Morgans have stood as larger-than-life figures, their reach extending from early merchant endeavors to contemporary financial juggernauts like J.P. Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, and Morgan Grenfell. Without a doubt, this old money family hasn't just participated in the creation of modern America, they are some of its primary architects and patrons. In today's video at Old Money Luxury, join us as we retell the entire family saga from their maritime merchant ancestors through J.P. Morgan, the man who essentially invented American finance as we know it, all the way to recent members you can find on social media with parents on reality television. It's quite the story, we'll tell you. With that said, let us begin. From their initial voyage across the storm-tossed Atlantic in 1636, the Morgan family have established themselves as integral elements in the American narrative from the very beginning. Departing the 17th century Welsh countryside, they sought the verdant possibilities of the then Massachusetts Bay Colony, guided by an intoxicating blend of zeal and the quest for an unblemished life. Their ancestor, Miles Morgan, initially settled in Roxbury, Massachusetts, before recognizing the greater opportunities that Springfield presented. At the time, he took on various roles, warrior, farmer, and revered community figure, and attempt to provide pivotal contributions to a colonial society in its infancy. Given such a backdrop as having ancestors here longer than the country has been in existence, sometimes called having American founding stock lineage, it is likely that the Morgans do not see themselves as mere citizens, but as a seminal part of the American founding pedigree. Over decades, this self-perception probably kindles both an exalted pride and a ceaseless ambition, with each successive generation perceiving itself as the custodian of an ancestry that had its roots in the earliest colonial vessels. This sense of duty has thus served as an impassioned catalyst for their various exploits, be it military service, commercial ventures, or their conspicuous role in the social strata. Therefore, as history's pages continued to unfurl, the Morgans continued to evolve from local merchants to dynamic participants in America's fight for independence and economic self-sufficiency. A quintessential portrait of this evolution is Joseph Morgan, Jr., the illustrious great-grandson of Miles Morgan. Holding the rank of captain in the Massachusetts militia, Joseph was therefore an active participant in the drama of the American Revolutionary War, not merely an observer. Post-war, Joseph ventured into the bustling commercial sphere of Connecticut. There, he operated a diverse array of enterprises, a tavern, coffee house, and stagecoach line, before co-founding the Etna Fire Insurance Company in 1819. Indeed, this endeavor has a legacy that reverberates even today. Etna has evolved into a colossal entity, 
its roots deeply embedded in the soil of American business history. In 1835, Aetna, under Joseph's direction, experienced a windfall, covering the damages sustained by Wall Street firms during the Great Fire of New York. The decisive moment arrived when Joseph purchased the stakes of hesitant Aetna investors, promptly dispersing insurance payouts to the beleaguered banks. This swift action cemented Aetna's reputation on Wall Street and catapulted its premiums in subsequent years. Therefore, Joseph's commercial triumphs represent a pivotal moment in Morgan history. He was the first family member to be intricately involved with a corporate titan that continues to exert considerable influence today. To put this into a bird's eye view perspective, the Morgans have thus been business pioneers longer than the United States has even been a country. Now, paving the way for future generations, Joseph would sire a son, Junius Spencer Morgan, destined to become another influential family figure on the global financial stage. Born in Holyoke, Massachusetts in 1813 to Joseph and Sarah Morgan, as was common for entrepreneurial young men of the time, Junior skipped the hallowed halls of university. Instead, at the age of 16, he apprenticed himself to Alfred Wells, a Boston merchant banker. For the next five years, Junius gained invaluable experience in the mercantile and banking spheres, absorbing the intricacies of the financial sector in both Boston and New York. You see, Junius was initially drawn to the sphere of business out of a keen sense for opportunity and an innate knack for numbers, more than a little influenced by the American ethos that equated financial success with virtue. Yet for all his prowess, Junius faced numerous challenges. His ventures, notably in the formation of J.S. Morgan and Company, were examined through the lens of ethical inquiry. Critiques often emerged about the firm's investments in enterprises of a morally ambiguous nature, industries built on the backs of underpaid labor, and deals that perpetuated social inequality. Though Junius's financial mastery was beyond reproach, it existed in a delicate interplay with ethical questions that resisted facile resolutions. In 1854, he subsequently embarked on a transformative chapter, uprooting himself to London, a calculated move underpinned by a melange of ambition and practicality. At that time, London was the pulsating heart of global finance and trade, providing Junius a grander stage to magnify his undertakings. In this teeming metropolis, he confronted an intricate tapestry of challenges. For example, America's burgeoning economic protectionism at the time often clashed with Britain's entrenched advocacy for free trade. On the flip side, Britain kept a vigilant eye on the fledgling United States, concerned that its global supremacy could be threatened by American ascendancy. Junius became the dynamic head of the firm in 1859, while Peabody remained the symbolic senior partner. He then inserted himself into London's high society, hosting opulent gatherings at his residences near Hyde Park and in Roehampton. And although Junius's Peabody and company had considerable involvement in the transatlantic cotton trade, their core business lay in relationships with eastern US banks and railroad companies. This strategic alignment allowed them to remain somewhat insulated from the direct implications of American slavery, a contentious issue that gripped many London-based banks at the time. Therefore, during the tumultuous years of the American Civil War, Junius aligned his interests with the Union. The firm capitalized on this allegiance, trading Union war bonds to astonishing profits. Thus, nestled amidst these geopolitical tectonics and economic dissonances, Junius evolved into an invaluable liaison between American magnates and their European counterparts. He found himself enmeshed in the complex interplay of British-American trade negotiations and international diplomacy. But as Junius and his associates deftly navigated the intricacies of international finance through J.S. Morgan and company, they could scarcely have foreseen that the legacy they were building would not merely endure, but would be monumentally amplified by the next generation through his son. Born in 1837, John Pierpont Morgan's path to financial eminence appeared practically preordained. Under the rigorous guidance of his aforementioned father, Junius Spencer Morgan, his upbringing was a fusion of privilege, deliberate strategizing, and a unique set of hardships. You see, Junius was unrelenting in his expectations, pushing his son to excel in every aspect of life. This demanding upbringing had its own difficulties, as John Pierpont was burdened not only by his father's monumental pressures to succeed, but also by a recurrent skin ailment, rosacea, which would accompany J.P. Morgan throughout his life. Furthermore, 
This facial condition not only scarred him physically, but also influenced how he presented himself to the world. Because of his skin issues, Morgan was selective about how he was photographed, often favoring profiles that lessened the visual impact of his facial challenges. Yet what many perceived as a facial anomaly became, in some ways, an asset in a ruthless business world. His imposing countenance, partly a result of his skin condition, became legendary for intimidating competitors and associates alike. It was as if his visage mirrored the formidable, unyielding nature of his character. Now, to mold his son into a refined, cosmopolitan individual, Junius sent young Morgan to a medley of educational institutions. From the Episcopal Academy in Connecticut to the University of Göttingen in Germany, Morgan's educational journey was as broad as it was elite. This eclectic upbringing served as the cornerstone for a life destined to leave an unforgettable mark on the American business landscape, framing not only his capabilities in finance, but also his nuanced understanding of art, languages, and the complexities of human life. However, J.P. Morgan's early career wasn't without controversy, particularly during the Civil War years. Viewing the war itself not as a calamity, but as a lucrative venture, Morgan dabbled in the morally murky waters of war profiteering. One episode that particularly stands out as emblematic of Morgan's contentious actions is the infamous Hall Carbine Affair. In this venture, Morgan financed the acquisition of 5,000 surplus rifles, each costing a mere $3.50. These firearms were subsequently sold to Union forces at a hefty profit, illustrating his willingness to capitalize on the nation's fractured state. Such maneuvers would cast a long shadow over his illustrious career, sculpting the narrative that painted him as a cold-hearted capitalist ready to profit from a nation torn asunder. Additionally, another noteworthy episode during the war occurred when J.P. Morgan's father received the crucial news of the fall of Vicksburg, before it was common knowledge in London's financial circles. Utilizing telegraph communications with his son John Pierpont in New York, Junior Spencer was alerted to this pivotal event in the American Civil War ahead of his competitors. Armed with this advance intelligence, the Morgans astutely seized the opportunity to buy up Union war bonds before their prices soared with the newfound optimism for the Union cause. This prescient move not only swelled their coffers, but also showcased the Morgan family's uncanny knack for exploiting real-time information, further consolidating their commanding presence in the intricate theatre of finance. Such episodes, marred by ethical dilemmas yet undeniably shaping his path, contributed to the complex legacy that the early Morgans would leave behind. They reveal a group not just of immense influence and financial acumen, but also ones who tread the blurry line between opportunism and the darker facets of capitalism. Now, in 1871, J.P. Morgan's career took a monumental turn with the formation of Drexel, Morgan & Company, a venture with Philadelphia financier Anthony Joseph Drexel. Operating as an agent for European investments in the United States, the company played a pivotal role in reshaping the American economy, which until then had a robust market mainly for railroads and canals. To be clear, Drexel, Morgan & Company wasn't just successful, it was transformative and it revitalized the American securities market and expanded the national capital market. But the company faced its fair share of controversies, often labeled as a symbol of greed and unchecked corporate power. However, at the dawn of the 20th century, John Pierpont Morgan found himself on the cusp of orchestrating what would become his financial masterstroke. Driven by an unquenchable thirst for consolidation and a vision of a streamlined, globally competitive American steel industry, Morgan aimed to achieve what no one before him had dared, the formation of the world's first billion-dollar corporation. The audacious venture took form as U.S. Steel, a behemoth birthed from the amalgamation of Federal Steel Company and Andrew Carnegie's Steel Leviathan. Morgan's strategic calculations were astute. By creating U.S. Steel, he sought to capture untapped economies of scale, thereby bolstering the competitiveness of American steel on the global stage. Indeed, the maneuvers he employed to pull this off were as complex as they were daring. Through skillful negotiations, a knack for understanding corporate value, and an unparalleled network of contacts, Morgan managed to convince key stakeholders that consolidation was the path to future profit and national prominence. Yet this monumental accomplishment did not escape scrutiny. Critics were quick to denounce U.S. Steel as a monopoly, 
a dominating force that not only sought to control steel production, but also aspired to wield undue influence over affiliated industries. Such aggressive labor policies and a voracious appetite for control fanned the flames of public debate. The controversy that enveloped US steel would echo in the chambers of policymakers, playing a significant role in shaping antitrust laws and labor rights for years to follow. Indeed, even as his titanic achievement with US Steel stirred turbulent waters of public discourse and legislative apprehension, J.P. Morgan managed to sail relatively unscathed. His cultivated social prominence and intricate web of influential connections, interwoven with a nuanced understanding of legal boundaries, afforded him a buffer from the severest of societal and legal reprisals. However, after the monumental creation of US Steel, Morgan would not rest on his laurels. He subsequently continued to be a dominant force in American finance, playing critical roles in stabilizing the US economy during periods of financial panic. Notably, his intervention in the Panic of 1907 showcased his immense influence, as he personally orchestrated a bailout of sorts, convening with other titans of industry to prevent a broader economic collapse. Additionally, as a patron of the arts, he amassed an extensive collection, including rare books and manuscripts, further etching his influence on American culture. But as time wore on, Morgan began to prepare for the inevitable passing of the torch. Though he would never completely step away from the empire he had built, he started laying the groundwork for the next generation. His son, J.P. Morgan Jr., would therefore inherit not just a business but an entire ethos, a philosophy of financial influence, social prominence, and yes, the intricate dance with public scrutiny and legislative oversight. Now, each successive generation of Morgans made its own unique contributions to the family legacy. Born as the heir apparent, the aforementioned John Pierpont Morgan Jr., commonly known as Jack, attended prestigious institutions like St. Paul's School and Harvard College before following in his father's footsteps in both finance and philanthropy. Later, Jack's high-stakes involvement in World War I would display an uncanny resemblance to his father's actions during the American Civil War. As his firm became the sole supplier of munitions for the Allies, he facilitated massive loans and supply agreements with the British and French governments, earning a staggering 1% commission on $3 billion. While these transactions significantly funded the war effort and brought him enormous prestige, they also attracted criticism. He was accused of influencing American foreign policy for personal gain, specifically. Allegations suggested he pushed the US closer to joining the war to safeguard his extensive investments. Therefore, this duality of financial success, marred by ethical questioning, echoed his father's controversial business choices during the Civil War. Both men leveraged national conflict as a springboard for immense profit, and both faced public scrutiny for their willingness to capitalize on such grim circumstances. Furthermore, the Morgans were seminal in the founding of America's central bank, the Federal Reserve System, in 1913. After the aforementioned Panic of 1907 revealed the fragility of the US financial system, J.P. Morgan Sr. played a key role in conceptualizing a centralized banking structure. The family's influence therefore pervaded the Federal Reserve's architecture, triggering debate over the extent to which private banking interests had molded public policy. Soon thereafter, the Great Depression wreaked havoc on John Pierpont Morgan Jr.'s financial empire, causing his assets to sharply decline from a staggering $704 million to a lesser $425 million. Adding fuel to the fire was the Senate's Pecora hearings in 1932, which served as a catalyst for public animosity against Wall Street titans, with Morgan Jr. becoming a symbol of a flawed and failing financial system. These hearings thereby crystallized the public's image of Morgan Jr. as someone who opportunistically profited during periods of economic hardship, further intensifying the scrutiny his family had long been under. Additionally, amidst this turbulent backdrop, Morgan Stanley was founded in 1935, conceived as a direct response to the Glass-Steagall Act, which mandated the separation of commercial and investment banking activities. The company was meant to carry on the Morgan family's investment banking operations. Specifically, Henry Sturgis Morgan, a grandson of J.P. Morgan, was among its co-founders. The inception of Morgan Stanley thus served a dual purpose. It not only complied with new federal regulations, but also provided a pathway for the Morgan legacy to adapt and persist in a drastically altered financial landscape. Therefore, the Morgan legacy wouldn't end with Junior, it would continue with his grandchildren, 
J.P. Morgan III and Henry Sturgis Morgan. United in their business acumen, they additionally fused two banking powerhouses, Morgan Guarantee Trust Company of New York and J.P. Morgan & Company to birth Morgan Guarantee Trust, which swiftly ascended the ranks to become a dominant global financial institution. This institution found itself in a complex geopolitical web during the Cold War era. As Morgan Guarantee Trust was intricately tied to significant corporations, both within the United States and globally, it couldn't escape scrutiny. Questions over the bank's vast influence and the ethical considerations surrounding its global footprint became subjects of intense discussion. Rolling into the 1980s, the Morgan lineage widened its financial focus by venturing into diverse investment channels. Alongside, they amplified their charitable work through ventures like the Morgan Family Fund and the Morgan Library and Museum. These altruistic efforts could not fully silence lingering questions about the source of their colossal wealth, a scrutiny intensified by the family's by then 100-year involvement in wartime profiteering and strategic corporate maneuvering. Now, the turn of the millennium saw another milestone when J.P. Morgan and company united with Chase Manhattan Corporation. This merger created a financial juggernaut, raising eyebrows around antitrust issues. Nevertheless, such concerns were eventually sidelined, allowing this new entity to consolidate its formidable status in global banking. As of the last few years, the Morgan family remains firmly rooted in the echelons of old money, albeit in a somewhat unexpected manner, and not always in a quiet wealth kind of fashion. One example includes John Adams Morgan, who tied the knot with fashion designer and reality TV star Sonia Morgan in 1998. They have a daughter, Quincy Adams Morgan, who has mostly been kept away from the public eye. However, pictures of her are easily found on social media. Quincy recently graduated summa cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania in 2023, before moving to Los Angeles to ostensibly find a new path. Simultaneously, keeping to the old money principle of intermarriage between noble families, there is actually an entire segment of the Morgan dynasty who are members of the British aristocracy. You see, Mary Lyman Morgan Burns, a sister of J.P. Morgan, had a daughter, Mary Ethel, who married into the illustrious Harcourt family by becoming Viscountess Harcourt in 1899. Indeed, the name Harcourt has been a fixture in British history, going as far back as the 1100s. Over the centuries, the Harcourt family has amassed considerable influence in various sectors, most notably in politics and diplomacy. Further cementing the Morgans' foray into British aristocracy, Cynthia Mary Burns, related to the family through Walter Spencer Morgan Burns, married Sir John Gorn Carew Pole, 12th Baronet, in 1928. The Pole Baronetcy is additionally one of the oldest in England, with a lineage dating back to the early 1600s, with roots in both politics and military service. Therefore, the story of the Morgans is a fascinating odyssey, from humble maritime merchants to powerful financiers who shaped epochs with tentacles reaching into the creation of America's financial infrastructure, intricate engagements in global conflicts, and connections to British aristocracy. Their influence is as complex as it is vast. And, as if to put a cherry on top, they've also become household names in the nation's most essential financial institutions. Thus, in many ways, the Morgans encapsulate the multifaceted dimensions of American financial and political history, embodying both the benefits and complications that come with immense power and wealth. When thinking of American old money dynasties, you may know families like the Rockefellers, the Kennedys and the Vanderbilts, storied names that have adorned the country's cultural and political fabric. Yet, lurking behind these more publicized dynasties is the saga of the DuPont family, a lineage that arguably eclipses them all in wealth and influence. Now, the Duponts first burst onto the American scene in the early 1800s as French immigrants with a keen eye for the untapped promise of a burgeoning nation. While most stories of this era feature settlers striving for basic survival, from the beginning, the Duponts aimed higher, a gunpowder empire set in their sights. And that's just the opening act. As the 19th and 20th centuries rolled in, so too did the DuPont's levels of immense power and prestige. Indeed, the family delved into arenas far beyond gunpowder, chemicals, materials, science, and even armaments. But what happens when a family steeped on the brink of becoming old money has to learn how to navigate scandals, market crashes, 
and the unyielding march of technological progress. In today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we'll explain that and more as we describe in sordid detail how the Dupont family went from new money to old money. Our saga commences in 1739 Paris, where Pierre Samuel Dupont emerges, a figure molded from humble origins yet infused with unrelenting ambition. You see, the mid-18th century in Paris was rife with socio-economic contradictions, with the opulence of the aristocracy clashing with the impoverishment of the lower classes, and all against a backdrop of intellectual enlightenment and cultural awakening. Despite the austerity shadowing his early years, Pierre Samuel's educational aspirations flourished, nurtured by parents who recognized and fervently nurtured his intellectual propensities. Certainly from youth, his intellectual curiosity was insatiable, perhaps fueled by an internal drive to transcend his modest upbringing, or possibly an innate quest to fathom the intricacies of human society. Without a doubt, this early brilliance was particularly noticeable in areas like economics and philosophy, disciplines that would later anchor the Dupont family's monumental rise. Now, Pierre Samuel soon entered the intellectual crucible of the Collège de France, a hub of progressive thought. There he immersed himself in the advanced theories of his time, methodically sculpting a formidable foundation in economics and philosophy. And after years of studious investment, his academic endeavors bore fruit. His seminal writings, specifically those exploring the complex interplay between economic structures and human behavior, became revolutionary texts in academic circles. And these works didn't merely garnish applause, they sparked fervent debates among scholars and thinkers alike. Furthermore, his scholarly achievements did more than win him academic acclaim, they propelled him into the corridors of political influence. His essays and treatises earned him advisory roles to key figures within the French governance including ministers and perhaps even members of the royal court. Once there, his insights shaped not only intellectual dialogues, but also influenced practical policymaking, making him a distinguished luminary of his time. But as history evolved, so did France's political backdrop. The cataclysmic onset of the French Revolution in 1789 plunged the nation into a vortex of volatility. And while initially an advocate of revolutionary ideals, Pierre Samuel's faith waned as the movement spiraled into zealous excesses. When he found himself incarcerated by the revolutionaries in 1797, the writing was on the wall. France, once a sanctuary, had turned treacherous. Confronted with this stark reality, Pierre and thus the Dupont family undertook a momentous decision that would recast their fate. They selected the United States as their sanctuary in 1799. Strategically speaking, this choice wasn't driven by mere desperation, but by a calculated vision. They perceived America as a cradle of untapped potential, a refuge where political perils could not shackle their ambitions. Thus, they set sail for a land draped in the promise of renewal. Yet, the Dupont's journey to America was not without blemishes of suspicion. Rumors circulated about their political alignments back in France, some speculated that Pierre Samuel secretly sympathized with radical Jacobins, notorious for leading the reign of terror. However, a scrutiny of historical accounts dispels these doubts. In fact, Pierre Samuel Dupont was a figure of nuanced ideologies. He neither espoused Jacobin ruthlessness nor condoned monarchical rigidity. He navigated a path in alignment with his principles, rejecting both extremities in a life that was anything but ordinary. Now, the early 1800s United States that the Duponts planted their flag in was a youthful nation on the cusp of industrial emergence. Pierre Samuel Dupont, then a French expatriate teeming with unyielding resolve, had decided within just three years of setting foot on American soil to establish a venture. The history books thus marked the 19th of July in the year 1802 as a momentous date that would herald in the inception of E.I. Dupont de Nemours and Company. Furthermore, the socio-economic conditions of the era were propitious for Dupont's entrepreneurial leap into gunpowder manufacturing. America's westward expansion, coupled with escalating geopolitical tensions, made the domestic production of the family's future cash cow product, gunpowder, not merely viable but indispensable. Moreover, the US market was primarily reliant on British imports, revealing a gap that begged to be filled. Even today, we can envision a gunpowder mill in Wilmington, Delaware, a daring endeavor in a landscape where the complexities of gunpowder manufacture loomed large. 
At the time, the British had firmly established themselves as the reigning giants of this volatile trade. Nevertheless, Pierre Samuel Dupont remained unwavering in his quest for a competitive stronghold. His audacity to challenge established industrial might displayed his acumen for business and an intrinsic understanding of market dynamics. And in carving out this niche, Dupont not only offered a domestic alternative, but also seized a chance to contribute to America's burgeoning self-reliance, aligning his own destiny with that of a nation in ascendance. Now, Pierre's recipe for success extended beyond mere ambition into the realm of astute strategy. His chosen location by the Brandywine River was meticulously planned, with the river offering the dual advantage of powering the mill and facilitating an efficient distribution network for his gunpowder products. Further complementing this was Pierre Samuel's relentless focus on quality. He imported seasoned professionals from France, ensuring that the company's operations were steered by expertise. Cutting-edge machinery became a signature feature of the mill, setting it apart from competitors. However, the journey was not devoid of setbacks. The War of 1812 temporarily bolstered demand, but the post-war landscape was less forgiving, forcing the company to diversify into realms like black dye and sulfuric acid. By the 1830s, the focus sharply shifted. Dupont pivoted his operations toward manufacturing black powder for leisure and sporting activities, a high-stakes bet that yielded significant dividends, and the company soon emerged as the foremost supplier of black powder within the United States. But the ingenuity didn't halt there. In 1834, Dupont broadened his portfolio, entering the textile industry with a new mill on the Brandywine River, purposed for cotton yarn production. This strategic move resonated with the rapid growth of America's textile sector and catapulted DuPont into a significant market role in cotton yarn. Yet this part of the story is punctuated with ethical quandaries. The 1840s saw DuPont becoming enmeshed in the American slave economy as slave labor was used in its cotton mills and its gunpowder ended up in the arsenal of slaveholders. Thus, a dichotomy of moral stances existed within the company. Pierre Samuel Dupont was an ardent opponent of slavery, whereas others like Eleuther Irene Dupont were slaveholders themselves. However, questionable ethics notwithstanding, in the coming decades, the Dupont lineage set forth their next major chess move, one that would catapult them into the echelons of America's most powerful and affluent families. Now, the American Civil War offered a critical juncture. The Union Army was in dire need of gunpowder. Recognizing the opportunity, the DuPonts secured profitable contracts, becoming an indispensable supplier in the war machinery. Indeed, the family didn't merely capitalize on this moment, they revolutionized it. With remarkable alacrity, the DuPonts expanded their production capabilities to satiate the burgeoning demand. By the cessation of hostilities, they had ascended to become the globe's preeminent gunpowder manufacturer. Their coffers swelled, marking their transition from wealthy entrepreneurs to American financial aristocracy. Yet, this ascent was not without its dark clouds. As the 19th century waned, the DuPonts diversified their influence beyond mere commerce, crafting a multi-pronged strategy to permeate political spheres. For instance, one notable milestone was the marriage of Eleuther Irene Dupont and Alice Bellin in 1890. Alice, daughter of an esteemed Delaware politician, functioned as a conduit, providing the Duponts a direct line to Delaware's political sanctums. However, the family's tendrils extended well beyond state lines. Henry Algernon Dupont, another scion of the family, took on a significant diplomatic role as the US minister to Italy from 1893 to 1897. These strategic affiliations and prestigious appointments were the cornerstones that anchored the DuPont family's political sway. But luminosity often draws shadows, and the DuPonts were no exception. As they reveled in the financial windfall accrued during the Civil War, they faced allegations of war profiteering. Critics claimed that the family had exploited the Union's desperation, levying exorbitant prices for their gunpowder supplies. But the DuPonts countered, asserting that their pricing was equitable, driven by the enormous demand rather than opportunistic greed. Nonetheless, these claims left an unforgettable mark, prompting public skepticism and demanding increased transparency in their enterprise. But overall, in navigating eras of war, prosperity and controversy, the DuPont family emerged not just as commercial magnates, 
but as multifaceted puppeteers, wielding considerable authority in both corporate boardrooms and political chambers. As the calendar pages flipped into the 20th century, the DuPont family's fortunes and dilemmas would evolve in parallel, with a seesaw-style existence of highs and lows that no one could have predicted. Now, the outbreak of World War I offered the DuPont family yet another stage for their mastery in explosives and gunpowder. Aligning with the Allied forces, they furnished indispensable war supplies, from explosives to other key materials. For the DuPonts, this was more than a commercial endeavor. It was a manifestation of patriotic zeal. Beyond supplying war materials, the family deployed their considerable wealth to ignite a flame of nationalism. For example, they underwrote war bonds and spearheaded patriotic events that invigorated the American spirit. Subsequently, their dual role of fortifying national defense and amassing immense profits was undeniable. With the government willing to pay a premium for quality war supplies, the DuPont coffers burgeoned. And in the Great Depression, an epoch marked by widespread financial devastation, the DuPont family demonstrated financial acumen and resilience, while many enterprises faltered. Specifically, their secret weapon was a canny investment in General Motors, or GM. Initiated in the 1920s, they had accumulated a dominant stake in GM by the decade's end. And despite the economic cataclysm that slashed sales in GM, the DuPonts remained unflinchingly committed to their investment. With strategic cash injections and managerial acumen, they buoyed GM during the Depression's bleakest hours. Their steadfast support wasn't merely optimistic. It was a well-considered gamble that ultimately yielded lavish dividends. As the American economy painstakingly resurrected itself, the fortunes of General Motors rebounded, and the value of DuPont's stake soared correspondingly. However, the latter part of the 1930s and the early 40s presented the DuPonts with judicial hurdles that challenged the very foundations of their empire. Accusations of breaching antitrust regulations, specifically in their gunpowder and chemical enterprises, loomed large. In response, the family countered vigorously, arguing that their operations were simply competitive strategies in a cutthroat market. But the federal government had its own agenda. In 1941, legal proceedings commenced against DuPont, unfolding in a protracted battle that would last years. Eventually, the government's unrelenting legal efforts culminated in the disassembly of the DuPont corporate structure into three distinct units, leaving questions open to whether the DuPont name could last into the modern era. Next, in the incipient years of the 1960s, the DuPont family found themselves at the vortex of an environmental maelstrom. The ecological fallout of their chemical operations was becoming increasingly hard to ignore, with air and water pollution linked to alarming health outcomes, including cancer. And initial attempts to dismiss these burgeoning concerns soon proved untenable. In 1962, a watershed moment materialized as the family established a specialized environmental protection division, funneling substantial resources into eco-friendly technologies. To align their internal ameliorations with public perception, the DuPonts launched an expansive public relations offensive. Through meticulous ad campaigns and strategic sponsorships, they sought to project an image of corporate responsibility, keen to demonstrate their bona fide commitment to environmental safeguarding. By 1981, the DuPont clan orchestrated a masterstroke that echoed through business corridors, a successful acquisition of Conoco, a leading energy firm. Indeed, this strategic maneuver marked a seminal chapter in their diversification agenda and solidified their footprint in the flourishing energy sector. The melding of Conoco into the family's industrial empire provided an appreciable boost to their earnings and extended their global reach. Looking at the contemporary landscape, the DuPont lineage continues to be a paragon of influence, with tentacles spread across sectors like business, philanthropy and governance. Yet, the family's journey has been punctuated with episodes of disquietude. In the early 21st century, the DuPonts encountered a renewed wave of scrutiny, this time focused on the health implications of Teflon, their iconic non-stick substance utilized in cookware. Scientific investigations revealed unsettling connections between Teflon and various health disorders, casting aspersions on the family's legacy. Initially defiant, the DuPonts eventually bowed to the weight of evidence, acknowledging Teflon's potential health hazards. In 2005, a costly denouement unfolded 
as the family consented to a sizable settlement. $16.5 million dispensed to laborers exposed to Teflon toxicity. This was coupled with pledges to recalibrate manufacturing protocols to minimize Teflon emissions. While these upheavals cast a pall over their prestige and dented Teflon sales, the DuPont family's sustained influence remains indelible. Their capacity to navigate treacherous waters, whether environmental, financial, or ethical, cements their status as one of America's most important old money families. Thus, from their initial footprints in France to their groundbreaking enterprises on American soil, the family's contributions span a broad swath of domains, chemical innovations, strategic acquisitions, environmental stewardship, and even governance and philanthropy. Each generation of DuPonts has imbued new facets to an already multifaceted legacy, renewing and refreshing the family's imprint on myriad sectors. Their story stands as a paradigmatic example, illustrating that even in the face of formidable challenges, resilience and ingenuity can carve a path to enduring relevance and influence.